both the government and Labour about their plans. And it's not just Putin. The Deputy Prime Minister Oliver Dowden's raising the alarm over more Chinese cyber attacks as senior MPs and peers are also being targeted. Whitehall sources fear Russia and China could be behind the wave of slurs and conspiracies against the Princess of Wales online in a bid to destabilise the country. And in sport this morning, Andy Murray may have played his last hard-court tournament. England's women have a great day playing rugby, but very bad day in cricket and in football. More injuries for Gareth Southgate ahead of England playing Belgium tomorrow. Hello, good morning. After a fairly quiet end to the weekend weather-wise, I'm afraid the week ahead does look unsettled once again. There'll be further spells of wind and rain at times, and I'll have all the details later. So to our top story on this Monday morning, the Prime Minister will declare a new funding to secure the future of the UK's nuclear industry. Uh, he's hoping that the new funds will create 40,000 new jobs by the end of the decade. Now, this is in response to concerns over the lack of defence spending from the Chancellor's spring budget. And the Deputy Prime Minister, Oliver Dowden, is expected to tell Parliament later today that Beijing is behind a wave of cyber attacks on senior MPs and peers. Well, what are we going to do about that? Let's find out mm. from diary editor at The Spectator, James Heal. James, uh, right, they, they say we know who's behind all this. What seriously are they going to do? What can they do? Well, in terms of the cyber attacks uh, from China, it's first of all about raising public awareness about this because we need to make sure our public bodies, like the NHS, etc., are well up to speed in order to try and deter these kind of attacks in future. Uh, and second of all, it's about sanctions and recriminations for those who are inflicting this. And therefore, uh, Oliver Dowden, the Deputy Prime Minister, is expected later today to announce sanctions on those involved in human rights atrocities in places like the Uyghur. Well, what, what sort of China. form do you think those sanctions will take? Well, it may be about freezing assets, it may be about detaining rights if they come here, it may be about um, even just calling them out publicly. Um, um, lots of different ways in which those sanctions can apply, all different ways, and we've seen in Russia recently in 2022, lots of those people that are connected to the Putin government have had those sanctions applied. But so you see, I, I don't understand. I mean, you talk about sanctions, James, but no. we will have contracts with public bodies, right? Big, multi-million pound no. contracts. There's no chance of a stopping those or cancelling those because where else do we turn to? Yet that seems to be the only way. If you don't want China snooping on you, don't have them running the businesses. That's a huge part, and that's what the China hawks will be saying. The people who've been sanctioned in Parliament are going to be making that case, I'm sure, publicly and privately, which is that you need to have conscious uh, uncoupling from China. You need to make sure that you're not actually economically reliant on their industries in different forms, and that sanctions is only one thing. But actually, are we going to have the kind of proper way in which to actually guard against uh, Chinese investment and overreach in these areas and have national security in all these things? Uh, on an election year exactly. as well, of all times, needing to be hypervigilant. Um, in a more sort of traditional form, Form, though, uh, we're going to be hearing news of trying to strengthen our defences in terms of uh, the nuclear deterrent today. Um, kind of desperately needed, isn't it, after that huge flop in the Atlantic last month when actually the Defence Secretary was on board yeah. when the Trident missile just went <clears throat> straight into the sea. But they're going to try and bolster it, which, <laughs> good, <Yeah. laughs> reassuring. Absolutely. So this is about a uh, £200 million investment going to be announced today in Baron Furness uh, up in the north of England. And this is really about trying to do several things. One is about ensuring the future of the nuclear deterrent, as you say, Isabel, but also about nuclear energy as well. And it ties in with the government's messaging on things like AUKUS, with the, that big uh, deal we signed with Australia and the US as well. Uh, this is about ensuring that you have the investment to kind of keep the nuclear technology going for the next 10 years. Uh, and also it helps with the government and their levelling up plans as well. Mm. Uh, again... Not sure I believe much of all of this. The nuclear stuff has been announced before. I've heard it and uh, we're, we're now rubber stamping it today. Uh, the uh, energy situation, um, this is part of the green project. This is, really. It's nothing about security. Mm. Well, this is the thing, it's sort of a bit belated, isn't it, uh, to come into the energy security focus. We've only had a bit sooner because uh, too much of our energy in that right now uh, is dependent on foreign imports. Mm. And obviously, we have a much better place to actually put sanctions on another regime, on Putin, etc., if we'd actually had much more of energy security. So it's partly a belated reaction to the mm. green agenda, as you say. It, 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 I'm literally reading a quote from Labour today who are going to say, take back control of our national energy security. I mean, are they effectively saying the same things but tackling it in different ways? I mean, Starmer wants to get Putin's boot off our 
our throat. Absolutely. And so Labour want to say this is about you know, patriotism, this is about making sure their green energy plans are seen as something that has appeal. It's not just a sort of niche green environmental issue. This is about ensuring that everyone can benefit from that and ensure we're not dependent on foreign Except regions. we just don't have the infrastructure for it. We don't have, I mean, this idea that... Um, uh, that you've got wind farms off the coast, for instance, uh, you get this to the mainland and then the existing way of transporting that electricity uh, will not work in this case. So it's the same for the nuclear plants and whatever. We need a mass of billions and billions of pounds ploughed in mm. to um, our electricity uh, network system, which we don't have. So yet again, I mean, I, I sit here today and I think... I've heard all of this before. It's all lies, or there are certain truths that, that they're omitting here. Mm. Well, I think also one big question for both politicians of all parties is not about so much spending, but about uh, planning and investment in terms of things like new nuclear power stations, for instance. Why haven't we built any mm. of those for decades? Uh, unlike, say, for instance, the French who have sort of gone ahead with that. So I think it does about sort of priorities as well. And there's one thing for people to say, you know, stand there at the podium and make the speeches, etc. Uh, but the key thing is actually going to build some stuff. And that... Why haven't we? Well, we have a very specific system of planning in the UK. UK, which actually encourages local opposition and deters national investment. Mm. And for those reasons, historically and locally, it's something mm. we've struggled with. But, you know, funnily enough, if you think about Hinkley Sea and other nuclear mm. power stations, there is a lot of foreign investment in those, mm. and not even excluding China when you look into the details. So it ties back to the story that we started with at the beginning. How do we invest in this kind of infrastructure with our own resources? Exactly. And it's been too much short-term thinking. We allowed in any kind of places like China General Nuclear, which was a big part of it, uh, and actually not being careful to ensure that we have mm. UK ownership of those things. James Hill, thank you very much. We'll be seeing you again a little bit later on in the programme. Yeah, James, because what we'll want to do is throw this out to uh, viewers and listeners to see what they think about this, and then we'll get your reaction to what they're saying um, later on. So, uh, GB views at gbnews.com. Uh, how would you run or protect our energy system within the country? Mm. Uh, what do you do about foreign investment mm. in our energy plants? And what about the type of energy we're using, how we're going to tap into it, and does the system exist to press a button and everything will be OK? I put it to you, it doesn't. Mm. I put it to you that we're being spun more lies today as well. So GB views at gbnews.com. And incidentally, this is the government who, in coalition with the Lib Dems, turned down the building of nuclear power stations. And now it's all as if, here's the answer, nuclear power stations. Well, if they had have started building them 10, 12, 14 years ago, maybe. But we had the chance. And through the Lib Dems, we said no to all of that. Mm. Uh, it's not just uh, the MPs and security and energy that the Russians and the Chinese are allegedly uh, interfering with. According to reports out today, the royal family have also been victim to this. Uh, China and Iran are fueling online conspiracy theories and disinformation about the Princess of Wales, according to a report today on the front of the Daily Telegraph. Well, this comes to senior royals rally to support the, the King and the Princess of Wales, uh, who are uh, undergoing their cancer treatment Let's now go to Royal Commentator Richard Fitzwilliam on all of this. Richard, good morning. Very nice to see you, my friend. Um, the, mm. the, the stories that we're seeing in the front of the, the papers today, front page of the Telegraph, as Isabel says, China and Russia behind slurs on Princess. Does it surprise you? No, it doesn't, because I think the trolling online was so vicious, so vituperative, so thoroughly nasty uh, that it was always going to continue. And I mean, you've not only got uh, certain groups who have a vested interest uh, in attacking uh, the, um, the Princess of Wales. And uh, indeed, it's been, it's been ghastly in recent uh, weeks. I mean, one has to bear in mind, of course, that uh, not only that, but also the fact that from the New York Times downward, this became a worldwide story. You had this ghastly business of, uh, for example, so-called sightings and when they are Occurred. And of course, the uh, reports, the London Clinic. Uh, that there were attempts to uh, access her medical records. I mean, this takes it a stage further and shows it to be organised by, or possibly organised by, uh, uh, hostile powers. 
The idea that, you know, spreading slurs about the royal family could be seen to destabilise society. I mean, they're not in power. They don't have control over our finances or anything like that. But there is such strong affection, they think, in this country that it could destabilise us. What do you make of that? Well, I think it's clear what uh, they they find somewhat threatening. If you look at our uh, primary source of uh, soft power, a royal trip abroad, the royal family, and the fact that they have a unique profile. I mean, it's uh, the highest of any royal family, and indeed our fa our royal family probably has a higher profile, bar possibly uh, the, those in the White House, uh, and of course those they change. So I think it's in the interest of a hostile state, if they could possibly spread or continue to spread misinformation, that they they would do so. And it does seem that uh, there may well be something on in, in this area that, um, well, let's hear what what uh, they've discovered, because clearly it is if you've got a particular family and you've got this international interest, uh, if you could, um, these slurs, if, if they continue, I mean, very clearly it is in the interest of uh, Britain's enemies. I agree with you, Richard. I mean, think about it. All the pictures we're looking at mm. there of Easter, of Christmas, you know, when the, the royal family turn up, they do their duties, everything that's supposed to happen. And then uh, if, if it's put into our mind, it won't always be like this. I, I remember I, re I, re I read quite a lot last week about Kate being the hope for the royal family. Now, I think the only hope, no, she's not, but she's a, a massive part of it, definitely. But I agree with everything Richard mm. is, is saying there, yeah. viewers and listeners. And I think that's why I often say on this programme, I like royal stories because they tend to have a positive slant. They, they lift the spirit. They're doing okay. things that are good. And absolutely, they are reassuring. So I agree with both of you, I have to say. Mm. Uh, and I wonder what our audience at home says. I suspect they'll agree with us on that as well. Can we just get your thoughts? Um, because... Neither Eamon nor I have been in since this devastating revelation on Friday night about the Princess of Wales and her health. What was your reaction? I mean, I still feel really sad every time I see pictures of her. I genuinely feel sad and really worried, and I and I really look forward to hearing that she's got rid of it and, and doing well. How, how do you? But she feel hasn't about got it? cancer. Oh, no, but she hasn't got cancer. Right. Right. She's been treated. She, they they found something which was taken away. That was all taken away, so it's not in her body. She's having preventative right. treatment in case that was to reoccur. But she hasn't got cancer. But nonetheless, uh, I found it tremendously difficult to watch. I mean, millions have been affected by this malign disease, my own family included, and I, it was so moving. I would say that it's perhaps the most courageous statement, a video message of the sort, when she was so clearly vulnerable, that's ever been put out by a public figure in Britain. Uh, it was very moving. The message also that she got across uh, was that other cancer sufferers could go, so to speak, on a journey with her. And a plea for time and space echoes of Diana's 1993 speech, but also privacy, which has been so important. And one looks at recent weeks and, well, months, and where there's been so much speculation, it's been a positive tsunami. Uh, it must have been desperately stressful. She talked of tough times. No one could possibly have had a tougher time when you have a major operation and you recover, and then you have to go through preventative uh, chemotherapy for cancer. It's absolutely awesome that she was able to do yeah. that. And you know, I say a certain vulnerability there that was so poignant. Richard, thank you very much indeed for your views and your, your opinions. So we've got people talking today. I think not only has she come through all of that, but she then had to explain to her children yeah. and as best as she mm. could what was happening and what the situation mm. was. And um, it, uh, I think that journey that so many people uh, suffer this awful, hideous disease and that she's saying, look, I'm on part of this journey with you, I think that gets a lot of support yeah. from people and they maybe no longer feel that they 
are on their own, that there is someone else uh, who understands what they're yeah, going Yeah, lots of children will look to Louis, Charlotte and George and think that they know what they're going through. And I also want to say, you know, my heart goes out to Prince William because we all know the trauma that he went through, losing his mum. Mm -hmm. uh, he's got the weight of the world on his shoulders, becoming king. He's lost his grandmother not so long ago. Now his father's got cancer. And now the love of his life, mother of his children, also uh, seriously unwell. Um, it must be very, very difficult for him. And as you say, all of those people going on a journey with the Princess of Wales, but I'm sure there are lots of uh, people holding their families together with all of that responsibility feeling very stressed as well. So um, send in your thoughts about that, mm -hmm. GBVs. And if you are going through it, our thoughts, are with you because we all know someone we all sit mm. and say have you been affected by this awful disease and um, we all have somebody a mother a wife a sister a daughter whatever an auntie whatever who's gone through this and uh, we'll all have a story to tell about it so the time quarter past six let's have a look at some other stories that you're waking up to on this monday morning we begin in moscow three suspects in friday's deadly concert hall shooting have been imprisoned for two months awaiting trial a total of 11 people were detained following the terror attack russia has made the claims that they were attempting to escape across the border into ukraine u.s intelligence services believe the attack was carried out by a branch of the islamic state terror group known as isis k meanwhile russia's black sea fleet uh, is now uh, we're told functionally inactive uh, this is according to our defense secretary grant shapps uh, you're seeing there a massive Ukrainian missile strike in Sevastopol. Security sources have told GB News that UK supplied Storm Shadow missiles were used in the strike. A major military communication centre has also been damaged. This is the largest attack on the Russian controlled port so far as tensions in the region continue to escalate. Uh, listen to this, a fantastic story now. Despite the cost of living crisis, the British public have donated a record £13.9 billion to charity in the last year. That's a 9% increase on the 2022 figure of £12.7 billion. Average monthly donations increased by nearly 40% to reach £65. Uh, the Charities Aid Foundation revealed it's the country's least affluent areas that are among the most generous as a proportion of household income. is something to make you proud this morning. Absolutely. That is something that the British do incredibly well and that moves me to hear that and I think it's, you know, mm. anybody who's finding the cash to give to somebody else when they're struggling themselves. Yeah, I think people heavenly. who understand what it's like and then they think, well, look, we're getting we're getting by, we're getting through, we wouldn't want anyone else in this situation. Mm. Commendable, absolutely, absolutely brilliant. And incidentally, we're going to be talking about, um, my producer said to me today, we're talking about lollipop ladies. I just want to know when lollipop men became lollipop ladies and why they're not lollipop people, people. and are there no men that do it anymore? And uh, we're, we're going to be talking about that. But also, I just want to point out um, the Russian story mm. about the concert hall, uh, the Crocus concert hall, mm. uh, and what went on there on uh, Friday. And um, I have watched a performance in that very have hall. You? I've been there. I've been behind the scenes. I've been throughout the whole shopping mall. Um, uh, and the thing about visiting the shopping mall there is that you look and you say, nowhere else did I see Russian people who just want to be westernised. Mm. All this talk about as if Russia's a different planet. All these people wanted to do was to buy a Jag car mm. or something from uh, one of the Zara boutiques mm -hmm. or whatever it is. They just wanted all those shops and the facilities available to them. And... Uh, I have to look to China now. And China and Iran. And, and then you look at what, what happened there and it's the most westernised, modern, Lovely. It's just a night out that you would appreciate. There were families there with children as well, and well over 130 of them mm. shot dead, yeah, murdered. Absolutely as a no result. support from the yeah. state either. If anything like that happened in London, you know that you would have armed response within minutes. It took an hour before anybody got there. Is Putin keeping his people safe? Uh, big questions about where this leaves Putin. Just six days, wasn't it? Five days after his re election with an 89% majority. Mm. Um, fascinating situation for him, but tragic in Russia. No. Lollipop ladies. Lollipop ladies, right. Lollipop people. 
Are there little sort of like you get little models of them, like Lego people, like <laughs> the lollipop people? But anyway, they do a great job. They do an essential job. Oh. But you've got Hampshire County Council is getting rid of 21 of them, right? Uh, they're getting rid of, and, and I believe there are men and women doing this job. But anyway, they're looking to save money. And the money, honestly, that they're looking to save is like pittance. Pittance. It's a million quid, right? So they say, right, what can we get rid of? Lollipop people. Now, my thinking about this is that um, surely, if they are to get rid of something, that's fine. But volunteers, now if someone came to your school and said to you, could you give me half an hour after school to be a lollipop person? You'd probably do it, wouldn't you? Maybe. No? <laughs> well, it depends. I'd do it. Yeah, it depends if I had time. Um, but, you know, volunteers is the solution, but it certainly isn't good enough to leave the kids to cross the road on their own. No. I hope that's not what they're suggesting. No, but, but, but what, what's the alternative? Yeah. Well, I mean, you, you have to have volunteers. You cannot just scrap the system mm. and say, we'll leave them to dart across that ro mm. road on their own. Though, I have to say, I never at any school that I went to had a lollipop person outside the front door, mm. but... Um, More traffic today, isn't there? Yeah, absolutely. So the council says there aren't enough pedestrian and vehicle movements to warrant the cost of some patrols. It only takes one to go wrong, remember? Um, so you would have to work at drop-off and pick-up times as well. However, parents say that the cost-cutting measures could endanger the lives of their children. Well, our South West of England reporter Jeff Moody has the full report. <laughs> Sharon Woodford has been guiding children across this street in Holbury in Hampshire for 32 years. She's phenomenal. She's phenomenal. She knows every single child by their name. So it doesn't matter how old they are. <laughs> it doesn't matter how old they are or anything. Yeah, she's been amazing. I don't know how I remember their names, but I do. You must really care. Yes, I do. And it'd be a shame to see it go, but what do you do? You know? Sharon's been told she may be losing her job, as the council says the road's not busy enough to warrant her salary. And she's not alone. 21 lollipop men and women in Hampshire are facing the chop in cost-cutting measures that may mean the end of school crossing patrols altogether. Parents are angry. Um, I think it's ridiculous. Um, she's here every day, twice a day, getting us across this road safely. It's the main road to go through this area. Uh, a lot of the kids that go to that school, they, they walk on their own from that direction, so they're on their own. So I just think that with all the money flying around in the world at the moment, the least they could do is afford to fund this wonderful person getting us across the road. Like many councils, Hampshire County Council says it's running out of cash. They say they have a hole in their budget to the tune of £132 million. After coming for 21 lollipop men and women, the remaining 163 school crossing patrols could be removed as well. In a statement, Hampshire County Council said, whilst we have a legal duty to promote road safety and take measures to prevent accidents, there is no specific legal requirement for us to provide school crossing patrols, of which there are currently 184 in Hampshire. We know that local communities value their school crossing patrol officers, and this is not a reflection on individuals undertaking that role. But there may be effective alternatives for some sites, such as installing permanent safety measures or improvements to make a crossing point safer. But locals say these cuts put their children's lives at risk. I think it's stupid because this road can be very fast, very fast. And like a lot of, load of the kids just come flying across. And she's there, she, she's like the safety hub of the road. Hampshire County Council says 13 services are facing cuts, from household waste recycling centres to bus services. Parents in Holbury have got together a petition to try and save Sharon Woodford's job. The council says it hasn't made any firm decisions yet and will only remove the service if a crossing can be made safe. Lollipop men and women have been a mainstay outside our schools for seven decades. For many, they're as British as fish and chips. But if councils can't balance their books, these stalwarts at our school gates may become a thing of the past. Jeff Moody, GB News. So it's all about councils balancing their books. Your suggestions, very welcome. How would they, should they balance those uh, particular books? Mm. Um, 
but I just don't think... I think... Do you know how much a lollipop person is paid? £5,271 a year. That is full-time. That works out at £11.79 pence per hour doing what they do. But they don't do... I mean, they do half an hour, an hour, or whatever it is, at lunchtime or whatever. But um, I think... I think you should just, you see, there's a whole thing about service in this country that we've seemed to have forgotten, mm. that it is the responsibility of the council, it is the responsibility of the uh, government, whatever. Why isn't it your responsibility, my responsibility, her yeah, responsibility, GC. the school's responsibility? Yeah. Why don't people just help each other? Know. We, we know from this, uh, this story um, today about what we're giving to charity, which is absolutely brilliant, 14 billion, record amount to good causes, despite the cost of living crisis. That is absolutely tremendous. Phenomenal. So we can do that. Why don't we just trust people to be community? And the area I want to get people involved in is litter. Actually, either executing people mm. who drop litter uh, the way they do, put them up <laughs> against the firing squad. Amen. Uh, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. But, go you know, round the country. I was country. just thinking. No, go, no. no. Go I round totally the agree. country. It is absolutely stomach churning mm. what they do. And this idea about mattresses. If I see another blooming oh, no. mattress lying by the side of the road, I'd love to get somebody who mm. dumped it there. You get cameras and then rub their face in mm. it, rub their nose in it. But you know what I was thinking. You know, and you're pricking my conscience about why would I not step forward to volunteer to be the lollipop person? And I think, you know what, people are so busy. People have so much on that they're obviously still generous. They're prepared busy to dig deep. Busy doing nothing, no. working the whole day Both through. Both parents work typically now. They're also trying to run a house. things not to do. They've all got to commute long distances because they can't afford to live near their They'll jobs. stop moaning. I'm not moaning, I'm just saying. You are that's moaning. Why... Oh, right. Yeah. OK, well, you've ranted for the last 22 minutes. So no, I'm just putting I'm, one... I'm only speaking on behalf of the people, okay. people like you from right. mainstream media, just purporting this, this argument okay, that we have no time busy. to Nobody's busy. We've all got lots of time to volunteer. But we're busy doing nothing. Mm. That's the, that is the whole thing. Mm. And the thing is, why isn't there more community spirit? Why do we not want to do more for the community around us? Um, because I would be very big on that. And my director shouted in my ear, whether next... Shut up. Right, <laughs> here we go. Uh, the weather update. And who have we got today? Oh, Marco Britannia. My favourite. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello, here's your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. After a quieter end to the weekend, things are turning more unsettled, I'm afraid, once we head through the new working week. Further spells of wind and rain to come across all areas, and that wet and windy weather is already pushing across western and southwestern parts of the UK. I think as we go through the day today, we could see some particularly heavy rain across the southwest of England, and that will start to turn to snow as it reaches colder air north of the central belt across parts of Scotland, especially later on this afternoon. Towards the southeast, we'll see the best of the brightness, although there will be some brighter skies towards the far northeast of Scotland, coupled with some wintry showers too. In that sunshine in the southeast, we'll peak at 12 Celsius, 54 in Fahrenheit, but it will be a colder afternoon towards the north. Turning very uh, unsettled across Scotland then as we go through the overnight period tomorrow night into Tuesday. A warning comes into a force at midnight because we see some heavy rain at low levels, snow across the hills, up to 20 centimetres or so of snow as by the time we get into Tuesday morning. And elsewhere it's a fairly mixed picture, some clear spells but also showers or longer spells of rain never too far away. But those temperatures generally hold up, at least away from the north where we will see a bit of a frost. Into Tuesday then, certainly through the morning, a very unsettled picture once again across Scotland. Further rain and snow to come, snow again mainly on the hills. And uh, elsewhere it's a case of sunshine, but with showers or longer spells of rain once again never too far away. And the temperatures will be struggling on Tuesday, no better at, uh, than uh, 10 or 11 Celsius towards the south. 11 is 52 in Fahrenheit, near 4 or 5 degrees in the north. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Morning, rise and shine. You're all getting talking this morning on energy. Mm. Emma says, I don't care whether it's nuclear, I don't care if it's coal, I don't care if it's gas, I don't care if it's from the moon. All I want is something I can afford. Good question, Emma, because it ain't going to be that. Mm. It has to be said. Yeah, uh, thank you for all of these. George says, uh, China, they own windmills, solar panels, energy works, also building programs. And we have been buying everything from China for years. The same as the USA, also electric cars and parts. Are you having a laugh? What can we do about China? Oh, I think that's a 
Fair point, mm -hmm. isn't it? Uh, they could, or you could, enter our spring giveaway competition, could you not? Oh, you could, yes. Mm. And it is the final week, so make sure you get involved. Uh, you could win uh, gadgets, a shopping spree, and an amazing £12,345 in tax-free cash. OK, so make sure you don't miss out, because here's what you have to do. It's the final week to see how you could win big. You could win an amazing £12,345 in tax-free cash that you could spend however you like. Plus, there's a further £500 of shopping vouchers to spend at your favourite store. We'll also give you a gadget package to use in your garden this spring. That includes a games console, a pizza oven and a portable smart speaker so you can listen to GB News on the go. You have to hurry as lines close at 5pm on Friday. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 double T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. Uh, still to come, we've got Paul Coit. He's got the sport. He's back after this. So are we. Hopefully so will you be. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the People's Channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Bit of tennis going on in Miami. It's the Miami Open, and um, Andy Murray is uh, is playing there. Paul. Well, he was playing there, but he's was not he playing on? there. <laughs> he's not playing. Oh. You've got to blink and you miss it. You know, but the thing is with Andy, it looks like we're we're watching the Andy farewell tour. So I'm watching every game and every time he plays. So played in the Miami Open uh, yesterday against Thomas Machuk uh, from the Czech Republic. Uh, there's Machuk there. Um, he, you know, he did well. I mean, it's always doing this. It's, it's fine margins. Um, he lost in a tie break in the last set, so it's the best of three sets that they're playing over in Miami. Um, tenth game of the final set. Andy hops towards the net, looks bad, twists his ankle, oh. um, and then carries on. But you know what his undoing was? It was almost like that he got so. Look, there we are. Look at that. Oh, oh. They, oh look, you'd think no. agony. You'd honestly, you'd look at that and think he's in all sorts of trouble. Mm. But being Andy Murray and being a man of steel that he is, he played on, oh. and um, and then he got upset with people in the crowd. He was saying, "Oh, actually, it was it was a steward that was moving," and he was saying, "You know, they need to stand still." And then he he started losing composure, yeah. and that probably was his undoing. Well, he mm. kind of feeds off losing his composure, though.
though, so I'm surprised. It's a good point. He does, he does. He's one of these that gets up yeah. really, really yeah, good. Yeah, he likes that. But again, it's um, this is hard. This is a hard court tournament, and this is probably going to be his last yes. hard court tournament, maybe ever, because now it moves on to the clay of Monte Carlo, and red clay is not his favourite. Whereas I'm a I'm a clay court specialist myself, so that's always I've always found that that was always good for me. <laughs> I just hope your tickets to Wimbledon are in the first couple of days, otherwise you might not see him. Well, we'll see. We'll see. Yeah, yeah. Well, the thing is, I do have tickets for like the first Tuesday, and I'm Perfect. thinking if ever there's a day, yeah. uh -huh. you go. people are thinking I'm going to buy. I'm, hopefully, I can get tickets for Wim Wimbledon final, so I can see Andy Murray's last day. I've got tickets for the second day, so I'm thinking that's, <laughs> that's going to be the one to be. At. Sorry, Andy, but we yeah. know how things are going to go. Ah uh, well, well. Uh, right, it must there be was... murder though with with red when they play on on clay. Yeah. Especially when it's raining. Can you imagine mm. having to wash those whites? Mm. They Honestly. don't wash them. They Do chuck them into they... the crowds or they've been them. Do you think so? Because they get so filthy. But anyway, yeah. that's 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 me and Mum um, there washing for me. It was uh, the women's Six Nations and the women's T20. It was a busy uh, weekend. There was a lot of women's football as well. Yeah, there was. Yeah. I mean, when when we talk about great sides in sport. England's Red Roses, the women's uh, rugby side, are unbelievable. They haven't lost a game in the Six Nations for six years now. So they played against Italy. Now, you'd think, as usually, um, Italy are, are the team that usually everybody could beat. It, it, was, it was a kind of a tough start, but in the end, 48-0, not lost a game in the Six Nations for six years, so they Crikey. continued And they were, that they were a player down. They were a player down as well. There was a sending off too, but even so, came through and the magnificent. England's women's cricket team mm. didn't have such a good day. It started off really well, playing New Zealand in the third T20 yesterday. So they're cruising along, 156 runs they need, T20, which is 20 overs each. They needed 29 runs from 29 balls, which... When you talk about a T20, it should be done pretty easy. Uh, Eight wickets left, and then the whole thing collapsed, and it was a disaster in the end. Started off well, but then it all went rather pear shaped. Paul, <laughs> football's say. fastest goal ever. Tell us about it. OK, I'll do this as quick as I can. Quickest goal ever in international football Austria versus Slovakia. Christoph Baumgartner scored after, well, the kickoff on the centre circle, skip past three challenges, low shot into the bottom corner, six. Seconds, wow. the fastest international goal ever. And then later on that evening, Germany were playing France. Florian Wirtz scored after seven seconds. Gosh. So if only he hadn't taken that extra touch, then he could have had the record. There you are. Fastest ever goal. OK. Thank you very much indeed, my friend. It's a pleasure. Uh, speak to you again after... I'm going to do the fastest ever sports bulletin. In the next hour. Oh, that's okay. a three seconds. I'm going to do the whole thing in. Okay. <laughs> uh, stay with us still to come. New funding for the UK's nuclear deterrent. We'll be speaking to the government minister Andrew Bowie about that next here on Breakfast. What does he related to David? Mm, probably. Not, not a very common name. Is it? <laughs> Britain's newsroom. Weekday mornings from 9:30. This is Louis Walsh, and if you're watching this year's series of Celebrity Big Brother, you will, you will know uh, what Louis Walsh has been talking about. It is the fact that he's been di diagnosed, or he's had a battle, with a rare blood cancer, and nobody knew anything about it, Joanna. Yeah, I mean, um, we all kind of remember Louis, don't we, from um, X Factor, and he's a very much loved character. Mm -hmm. Louis always used to be the one that would kind of take all the kooky acts and all the quirky <laughs> ones. Obviously, it's incredibly brave for him to actually share something so private um, about this diagnosis that he had. Um, but also, you know, when things like this happen with people who are public figures, it also brings a lot of awareness, and a lot of people have been watching Big Brother. We're obviously talking about it now, when this is the type of blood cancer that I'd never heard about. I mean, it is incredible, isn't it, really, what it would do to raise awareness for people? For sure. And I think it's really important because I think quite often people watch these programmes and it can be a little bit silly and mm -hmm. arguments and stuff, but actually when someone that's got a lot of media attention, like Louis Walsh, mm -hmm. talks about this, a lot of people start mm -hmm. to think, you know, cancer research do a lot of good work. I'm not shocked that he's doing that. He's, he's a very Marmite figure, you know. Mm. Uh, you know, a lot of us have seen what Jedward have been saying about Lou Walsh behind the scenes, you mm. know. He's a very kind of, a lot of people say he's quite a nasty figure. Oh. You know, he's been in the show business a long time. He knows how to get certain people to do certain things. And I think he's, um, he's great for the programme, though, because, you know, that's what we want, right? We want reality TV to be exactly how it is, you know. Mm. Yes. That's actually I one thing that, that I've, I thought in terms of casting for Celebrity Big Brother, they did a really good job yeah. in getting Sharon 
Laurent and Louis, Louis in there. We're getting all the Hollywood gossip. Yeah. You know who they like, who they don't like, and I think Simon that's been the great. Day. That was good. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Is he a colourful character? Colourful, yes. That's how you. But just... when you said he's like Marmite, you got to think you can put a bit of Marmite in your bolognese and it tastes good. Welcome back. We're joined uh, by the Minister for Energy Security and Net Zero. It is Andrew Bowie. Good morning to you. Thanks for joining us uh, on GB News. You want to tell us this morning about plans to invest in Trident. Um, tell us a little bit about how much government money is being invested in this. Yeah, so we're announcing today that alongside industry, we're committing £750 million to uh, bolster the nuclear workforce here in the United Kingdom. We've got so many exciting projects coming down the track between civil nuclear and defence nuclear. We need to ensure that we have the skilled workforce here in the United Kingdom to be able to deliver that. So our plans today will enable us to increase the workforce delivering these nuclear projects, be that the new Dreadnought submarine programme, our AUKUS submarine programme, or our huge civil nuclear build, uh, to about 40,000 by 2030. And it's a combination of industry and government money that's being invested here, but it's, a, it's an incredibly important day. Later on today, we'll also see a, a defence a command paper on nuclear being published by the Secretary of State for Defence, really underlining and outlining how important our uh, nuclear deterrent, our continuous at-sea deterrent that's been providing security for the United Kingdom for over 55 years, uh, is to the UK and indeed to our ally security. So it's an incredibly important day for, uh, for nuclear. I wonder what prompted Grant Shapps to, to make this decision so uh, late on, I suppose, in a 14-year term uh, for the Conservatives. Is it anything to do with the embarrassing missile flop in the Atlantic around a month ago? He was on board, wasn't he, where the Trident missile uh, failed to launch. Uh, lots of people saying, is it fit for purpose? Indeed, Labour shadow Defence Secretary saying reports of the Trident test failure are deeply concerning. Uh, there was no actual test failure. We've got full confidence in the Royal Navy and our submarines and in, indeed in our systems uh, for defending uh, the United Kingdom. This announcement has been made because over the past few months we've seen a series of announcements uh, regarding civil nuclear capacity being increased, uh, our AUKUS submarine programme, our Dreadnought submarine programme, and it was recognised that we needed to build up the skilled workforce here in the UK uh, to deliver that. So that's what today's announcement is about, as well as bringing it all together in a command paper to sort of outline uh, our confidence and how important uh, our continuous deterrent actually is to the UK. Um, what about the allegations, I suppose you could call them, that people are saying actually this is just trying to focus on green energy, clean energy, without calling it that, by saying it's all about, you know, making sure that there are jobs in the north, or it's about levelling up, or indeed it's about um, <laughs> energy security in the face of international threats. But is this effectively a green pledge that you're announcing today, but you just don't think that will be very palatable to the electorate? Well, no, look, I mean, obviously, the nuclear is clean technology. It is clean energy. Uh, there is no net zero without nuclear. That's been recognised uh, across the world. But one of the huge benefits of, of all of this investment in new technologies, including nuclear, is that we're going to be creating uh, hundreds of thousands of new high-wage, high-skilled jobs, the length and breadth of the country, many in places where high-wage jobs uh, are actually at a premium. And that's why I'm so excited about the investment that we are making today uh, in Sizewell C and Hinkley Point C in a third gig what scale project coming down the line after that and our small modular reactor program this is going to create a whole new uh, range of energy technologies to support our transition to uh, become more energy secure and independent but yes it is about creating uh, new jobs in parts of the country where where they are desperately needed are we investing enough in cyber security? Take a look at the front pages this morning. China hack attack on UK. This is in relation to voters. Uh, in 2022, this all came to light. In the front of the Telegraph, talking about China, Russia and Iran being behind the slurs on the Princess of Wales. Perhaps we need to be investing more in protecting our democracy against these kind of hostile states. Well, I mean, I think we've demonstrated over the past few years through uh, the various acts of parliament that we have uh, used to bolster uh, the powers of our intelligence and security uh, forces that we take the uh, defence of democracy and the defence of the British people uh, incredibly importantly. And we won't stop at anything to ensure that democracy and freedom of speech and indeed the British people uh, are protected. And I'm sure we'll be seeing more on that uh, later on today. Uh, we take it incredibly seriously, as I said, and that's why we've taken the action we have. Minister, are you Bowie or Bowie? 
I'm Barry Eamon. I see this fascinates me. It always fascinates me. At the Alamo, uh, Jim Bowie, who fought at the Alamo, he wasn't a Bowie, he was a Bowie. But I, I just, it's, it's the sort of yeah. word that you, he was... you get with the famous singer David. I mean, you get so many DJs calling him Bowie and so many people calling him Bowie. And I, I just wondered. Yeah, well, it's Bowie in my case. Uh, all the rest are imposters, frankly. <laughs> ah, OK, OK. Got you there. Thank you very much indeed. Very good talking to you. Appreciate it. Um, Thanks we very have much. Got, not at all. We've got Christopher Biggins and Don Neeson uh, to talk about some of the stories making the headlines today. And uh, Biggins um, and Don, the first thing I want to talk about is um, uh, lollipop people uh, being scrapped. And uh, there, there's this uh, cost-saving uh, term going around. They cost a million quid a year. And um, which is really nothing in terms of a council's budget. But um, what do you think about lolly people going? And Biggins, would it be something that you would ever be tempted to do? Well, funnily enough, you should say that. No. <laughs> no. Yeah. I, I, I think the abuse they get. Do they? I think they get a lot of abuse from motorists who, you know, are stopped when they're in a rush to get somewhere uh -huh. and they suddenly uh -huh. walk out. I think some of them are very arrogant, too. I think they take it too seriously. They think that they are... A little bit are... of power. Absolutely. <laughs> that, that lollipop gives them a lot of power. <laughs> and I think they... Sometimes you, you can see them... Uh, if, you're, if you're stopped just before... Yes. And you can see... And the children... You, I feel the children don't like them either. Oh, gosh. I think there's a lot of aggravation there. Goodness. If you're so a lady want... or man this morning, get in touch and defend yourselves against <laughs> such slurs. What do you think, Don? Would you do it? I'm, I'm saying that I think I don't think it should be a paid council uh, position. It should be voluntary and should be organised by the schools. And I think there'd be a lot of people in a neighbourhood who would say, I'll go and do half an hour or an hour there. I think, uh, yeah, I'm, uh, whether it should be paid or not, I'm not sure, but I think it can be an incredibly hard job. It's very nice at this time of year when you've got nice, light, warm days coming up, but imagine standing there in all weathers doing that. So maybe they do deserve paying, to be honest with you. But you get out and about and you mix with people and, you know... Yeah, but most of them are hurling abuse at you, Eamon. Well, give them phasers or stun guns <laughs> or something then to <laughs> electrocute anybody that, that, that does, does do that. Um, so, right, thank you very much for that. What about this uh, charity situation, Don? 14 billion given by people in the United Kingdom despite a cost of living crisis. Well, I, th I think, you know, the cost of living crisis, it's become a phrase now we use in every single area, isn't it? It really is. It's like the cost of living crisis. And yet if you go to many places, it's, it, you, you're not getting that feeling a lot of the time from... What, what feeling? The, the, the people really are in a cost of living crisis. There is they one, are! Well, there, there is and there isn't. And I think this cost of living crisis now is covering a multitude of sins. And the fact that so many people are giving to charity, I think it demonstrates that even in a cost of living crisis, and I'm very aware of that phrase, um, people are still very generous and still very willing to give to causes that are close to their heart. But I think both political parties now are using this cost of living crisis to get away with so many things. Yes, people are struggling. Yes, times are hard. But I, I think if you go to many places like shops and restaurants, and lots of places are really, really busy still. So I'm very wary about how we trot out this phrase uh, now. No, I don't agree with you at all. I think everybody hurts with this. And I think if you've got kids, you would, you would think three of us going to the cinema, whatever, no way, no way, Jose, what no, do you think? but people are still what? doing it, Eamon, that's They're the not thing. doing it to the same degree. I mean, and you just ask anybody who works in an entertainment or catering industry, and it's, like, through the floor. It's really. suffering. Yeah. Mm. So a, but I think, interesting, this 14... Is it million or billion? Billion. billion? billion. 14 billion is probably due to the fact that a lot of people are going into uh, competitions to earn, like the lottery, to earn a lot of money. So that I think that's the other interesting thing. They are trying, they are paying into charities, but hoping to get, get something back, back, to get back a huge amount of well, money. Really? Mm. So you think a lot of this is only through people entering a ballot? Or... I think, I honestly Finding think... Finding that slant on the good stories this morning, aren't you, Ben? <laughs> well, I mean, I, but I think it's been... true, though. I think I it's, you know... No, I yeah. think people have seen the horrors unfolding in the Middle East, in Russia, yeah. in Ukraine, and people are moved. And, and I think British people are just incredibly generous. Well, they are generous. You, you switch on the television now and there's a whole new spate of uh, charity adverts giving houses away, 
post-cook mm, Absolutely. Lotteries, all sorts of things. I mean, Davina McCall's now advertising one as well. Yeah. There's the, they're popping up everywhere. Exactly. Even this company's giving 12000 away. But I'm so, pretty sure that's not for charity. I think we... <laughs> so there's, there's money and misery, you're saying? I think so. Mm. I, I think the what, get, crossing the two stories over here with the royal story and the whole cancer thing. I mean, I did a, yet another marathon bike ride um, for prostate cancer over the weekend. So I'm sort of like trying to do that. And I think the fact that we're now talking about things like cancer so much is encouraging more people to give, certainly to medical charities, mm. to help raise funds for that. For sure. I'm sh once again, Red Nose Day this year was fantastic, the amount of money they raised. Yeah. Well, except um, everybody, all the parents I know were saying, they couldn't get their hands on a red nose anywhere and pretty much all of the schools failed to market oh. um, and there was a bit of a sort of backlash all the parents saying why aren't they doing this so the schools don't seem oh, really? to be behind it in the same way the red nose um celebrations i remember comic relief being a oh, huge oh you couldn't move deal. a red nose yeah. for everything yeah. weren't they? so i don't know what's happened there and uh, let's talk about uh, pubs and closing times um, Christopher, this is front page The Mirror today, and uh, basically th th they say that um, a lot of pubs are closing just at 8 o'clock. Um, they don't sell food, or they shut all together on quiet stairs to save on staff and energy costs. Well, I think this stems from Brexit, because I think, you know, so many people left the country uh, who wanted... who were. Mm. were workers and used to work in the pubs. And I think, you know, nowadays, it's it, like, for instance, heating, just heating the place. So, I mean, people go along there, I think, not only for a, a pint uh, or a gin and tonic, but also to get warm. Uh, and, the, and I think it's costing these pubs a huge amount of money. Mm. The rates are, are bad. So to make the profit nowadays is not as easy as it used to be. Mm. Mm. When people used to go to the pub to have a socially mm. uh, a good evening out, you know, I think now they're doing it at home. They're going and they're buying their bottles of beers and, and, and drinking it at home. Well, that's the thing. It's very cheap to go to a supermarket and buy bottles of beer yeah. rather than going to a pub where you're going to pay four, five, six times as much. I mean, I think, a, what is a pint of beer? As I read somewhere this morning, it's four, £4.85 no or idea. something. It depends where you buy yeah. it. I mean, if you're buying it in, you know, West Ham, it's six quid. Yeah. Six quid? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I remember when I was 16 and working in a bar, um, there was uproar that uh, the price of a pint rose from 35p to 50p. <laughs> wow, yeah. Absolute uproar yeah. um, about it. Mm -hmm. um, Don, the, this awful situation in Moscow, and this terrorist attack on Friday night, 137 people dead. It's, yeah, and absolutely. And this is uh, um, in, in all the papers today, front of The Guardian. I've got pictures, quite harrowing pictures, of the actual suspects who um, have quite clearly been tortured by um, the, um, the, uh, the police forces in, in Russia. And there's a, an awful story about how one of them had his ear cut off and was forced to, was shoved in his mouth. But it's two suspects have appeared in court. But the, the, the interesting thing about this story is even though ISIS-K have claimed responsibility for this attack, which, which must have been terrifying, you watch the footage and it's just awful, these poor people at this concert again. Um, but even though ISIS-K have claimed responsibility, Putin is refusing to accept it. I mean, in the speech he gave, he didn't name the Islamist terror group once during his public statements on the attack. And the Russian Foreign Ministry spokesman has said, uh, um, well, you know, <laughs> the Americans are saying it's, it's um, ISIS, but what do they know? They can't even solve who killed President Kennedy. Well, so Americans are I, warning, I know, I know this uh, concert hall so well. This is the Crocus City Concert Hall. And um, I filmed in Moscow and I spent two days, a day filming there and a day watching a performance as well, and the amazing shopping mall around the whole place. And it's really sobering to think that in this wonderful scenario, which we would all feel very much at ease and at home with, uh, burnt to the ground now and 137 people murdered. Absolutely yeah. terrifying. Um, and, you know, you think... I'm sure some people think, well, the Russians deserve that, but no-one deserves that, yeah. though. I mean, Putin deserves that, but not his people. Yeah. And these were... They were children. Children, there. Uh, you know, and uh, how they can do this... But then 
this is what's happening all over the world now. Mm, mm. There's no thinking at all from these terrorists as to who they're hitting, who the individuals are. Children, I mean, what they, what's happened in Israel? What's the benefit of that? Exactly. Yeah. Also, seeing these mugshots of the of the perpetrators in the front, I mean, a lot of people have, will have very little sympathy for them. Of course. Um, and, you know, yes, they're being tortured, but, but people might not care. But I suppose, for me, it underlines why it is so important to have a strong judicial system. Because you give Putin two weeks and he'll have forced these people through torture to sign a confession saying Ukraine was responsible, this was Zelensky, and use that this, as a reason to. This you know, is the very reason. Argument. That's the reason, yeah. Isabel, and that's why you look at those pictures and they are suspects, okay? And this is, but this you is have to Russia. Have justice, because otherwise you have it's too. And but you know, watching the footage of the, of the actual attacks, you just have an instant flashback to what happened in Manchester. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely chilling. I mean, mm. children should be enjoying themselves at a concert, running for their lives in terror. Mm. Not good. Not good. Not good indeed. Well, listen, uh, lots of you have been getting in touch this morning on a oh, range yeah. of topics. Keep those thoughts coming in. Lollipops has got you all talking. Yeah. <laughs> uh, councils yeah. are wrong to remove these people who keep our children safe. The government and councils remove funds for community activities like libraries and village halls, but yeah. can send millions to other countries like India. This is from Brian. Something's okay. wrong here. Um, just want to say to you all, at 20 past eight this morning, we're going to be talking about vet bills. And this is a, a very interesting story. Um, Dan Brocklebank, an actor in Coronation Street, uh, basically he had trouble with his dog and he was given tablets which were costing uh, £26.90. Um, his overall bill was 2,000 quid. And he found out that the tablets were available at the local pharmacy for 38p each, right? <laughs> So how much are you being ripped off? How much would you pay for your animal? And uh, we'll be talking about that 20 past eight. Here's the weather. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar. And sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello, here's your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. After a quieter end to the weekend, things are turning more unsettled, I'm afraid. Once we head through the new working week, further spells of wind and rain to come across all areas. And that wet and windy weather is already pushing across western and southwestern parts of the UK. I think as we go through the day today, we could see some particularly heavy rain across the southwest of England. And that will start to turn to snow as it reaches colder air north of the central belt across parts of Scotland, especially later on this afternoon. Towards the southeast, we'll see the best of the brightness, although there will be some brighter skies towards the far northeast of Scotland, coupled with some wintry showers too. In that sunshine in the southeast, we'll peak at 12 Celsius, 54 in Fahrenheit, but it will be a colder afternoon towards the north. Turning very uh, unsettled across Scotland then as we go through the overnight period tomorrow night into Tuesday. A warning comes into a force at midnight because we see some heavy rain at low levels, snow across the hills, up to 20 centimetres or so of snow as by the time we get into Tuesday morning. And elsewhere it's a fairly mixed picture, some clear spells but also showers or longer spells of rain never too far away. But those temperatures generally hold up, at least away from the north where we will see a bit of a frost. Into Tuesday then, certainly through the morning, a very unsettled picture once again across Scotland. Further rain and snow to come, snow again mainly on the hills. And elsewhere it's a case of sunshine, but with showers or longer spells of rain once again never too far away. And the temperatures will be struggling on Tuesday, no better at, uh, than uh, 10 or 11 Celsius towards the south. 11 is 52 in Fahrenheit, nearer 4 or 5 degrees in the north. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. It's the final week to see how you could win big. You could win an amazing £12,345 in tax-free cash that you could spend however you like. Plus, there's a further £500 of shopping vouchers to spend at your favourite store. We'll also give you a gadget package to use in your garden this spring. That includes a games console, a pizza oven and a portable smart speaker so you can listen to GB News on the go. You have to hurry as lines close at 5pm on Friday. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 double T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. 
Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And why it matters to you. From your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. Good afternoon, Britain. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Good morning, fast approaching 7 o'clock. It is Monday, the 25th of March. It's my mum's birthday, I should point out. Happy I can't birthday. read the date without saying happy birthday, mum. That's nice. Um, so it's a new day, it's a new week, and it's a new programme for us. Eamon and Isabel here with you until 9.30. Our top story today, a boost to our nuclear defences set to be announced as the threat of Putin is looming large. We've been speaking to the government. We're about to speak to Labour about all of this in just a moment. Not just uh, Putin, Deputy Prime Minister Oliver Dowden raising the alarm over more Chinese cyber attacks as senior MPs and peers are being targeted. And it's not just the government being targeted. Whitehall sources fear the two nations could be behind the wave of slurs and conspiracy theories against the Princess of Wales online. This is all in a bid, they say, to destabilise the UK. Which is why today we are debating whether you need stronger internet regulation to stop harassment online and misinformation. We'll be debating that at 7.20. And in the sport this morning, Andy Murray loses in Miami. England have more injuries ahead of their friendly with Belgium. And the greatest figure skating score ever set has been done by American Ilya Malinin after landing a quad axle, quad lutz, Quad loop and quad salco followed by a triple flip, quad toe loop with a combo of triple toe and then added triple lutz, triple axle combo. Sorry? <laughs> I'm gonna go and have a lay down now and just try and relax for a while. Hello, good morning. After a fairly quiet end to the weekend weather-wise, I'm afraid the week ahead does look unsettled once again. There'll be further spells of wind and rain at times and I'll have all the details later. So, our top story this morning. The Labour leader, Keir Starmer, is set to outline plans today, in his words, to take, to take back control of our national energy security as part of his ambition to create a more patriotic economy. We're now joined by the Shadow Secretary of State for Wales. That is Joe Stevens. Joe, good morning to you. Uh, what do you mean, what do we mean, Joe, by a more patriotic economy? Well, we're here in North Wales. I'm with Keir Starmer and the new First Minister of Wales, Vaughan Gething, to talk today about Great British Energy. So Labour is committed to taking back control of our national energy security, and we're going to do that through Great British Energy, so a publicly owned clean energy company. And we'll set out our plans today for secure, homegrown British energy. That will mean that we'll invest in clean energy generation, that will cut bills for businesses and households across the country, create good, well-paid jobs for people across the country as well, and at the same time, take back control of our energy security so that we're not relying on tyrants like Vladimir Putin. The, it all sounds very well and good. How long would it take to even get anywhere close to what you're talking about? Well, we have the um, funding in place. We've explained how we're going to fund Great British Energy through the windfall tax. And for every pound of government money that goes into it, we'll be bringing in three pounds from the private sector. And this is a really exciting, bold and ambitious plan. You know, we'll double onshore wind, we will treble solar power and we will quadruple offshore wind. And here in Wales, particularly, we want to pay, play our part in powering the UK for generations to come. It's a really exciting plan and we're ready to deliver it. But all of, if we're alive by the time it comes about, I mean, you know, again, I ask you how long. Are you talking five years, 10 years, 50 years? What are you talking about? 
But we, we can start straight away. And one of the real failures of the government for the last 14 years is that they have wasted 14 years where we could have been investing in things like floating offshore wind, um, instead of which we've had no industrial strategy, we've had no plan from the government, no decisions or you know short-sighted decisions have been made. So, And in that time, foreign governments have been profiting from our energy systems in Britain. So they're making profits on the back of British energy systems and bills have been going out up for households and businesses across the country. That's um, it, in Wales particularly. So I was in the port of Milford Haven last week talking to companies there. You know, they are they want a renewable energy hub. They that port brings in twenty percent of current UK energy into the country. They're ready to invest in our plans. They want to see it happen. And at the moment, you know, we're not even at the starting line after fourteen years of failure and and no decisions being made. Um, yeah, you say we can start straight away, but still no mention of, of when that would would come on stream. And you talk about this being a clear dividing line with the Tories and yet we were just speaking to the Conservatives just a few moments ago uh, also talking about a public-private partnership to try and bolster our energy security but in their case talking about nuclear no mention of that from you well, firstly, on your point about when will it come on stream, you know, we've got a very clear target that we've set ourselves, which will be part of our manifesto about clean energy by 2030. So you're looking at, you know, within five years, we've got a pretty demanding target that we're determined to meet of having clean energy by 2030. So that's very clear. On the um, nuclear uh, announcement that the government are making today. I mean, obviously, it's the first duty of any government to protect the nation and our support for the deterrent is total. You know, it's a cornerstone of national security. So we welcome, at long last, a defence nuclear strategy from the government. We've long argued for ministers to secure jobs in Barrow, for example, and across the submarine supply and into the nuclear sector. Um, you're talking about being in Wales, uh, Keir Starmer being in Wales today. I want to ask you about Vaughan Gethings. He's uh, the new Labour uh, First Minister uh, in the devolved nation. And um, there are lots of reports about, you know, the criticism of the Conservatives in relation to the Tory donor, Frank Hester. But I want to ask you specifically about the £200,000 in donations that Vaughan Gethings has received off a twice convicted criminal uh, and where this whether or not you think this meets the standards uh, of the Labour Party and indeed if you think the same treatment should be given to him as you've been calling for with Frank Hester. Well, first of all, his name is Vaughan Gething. Um, and secondly, this is a completely false equivalence with um, the Frank Hester situation. Vaughan's donations were within the rules under the Welsh Labour leadership election rules. Um, he has declared them. They are in line with what is required in the Senate and the Electoral Commission. And he has already announced that for future leadership elections, um, there's going to be a review about the rules, which will include rules about donations to think about whether or much not there should be caps on donations, for example. And that review will start very, very quickly. So drawing a, an equivalence between the Frank Hester situation okay. and Vaughan Gething, I but, think, is completely okay, wrong. But, but there is an admission if he wants to look at the rules that actually he thinks there are some kind of moral failing here because he's accepted no there's no admission there's no admission of moral failing at all so no that's, that's, okay that's, that's not the case thousand pounds from a convicted criminal and, and you're saying that just because it's met the the rules that's okay he had donations to his campaign, as did the other candidate. The, the donations are within the rules. And so to draw an equivalence with what has gone on with the £10 million from Frank Hester, who made racist Why? comments Why and, and said that one of my colleagues, a black woman MP, should be shot, I think is a completely false equivalence. But I'm asking you why he wants to review these rules if they're totally fine morally. Well, he has recognised that there, there's been criticism of it, and so he is addressing that criticism directly. And actually, after every leadership election, we have a review of the rules. There's always been a review of how the election has gone, whether we need to make any tweaks and changes, and that will be a matter for the Welsh Labour Party to decide. Joe, let's go back to energy and something. I want to bring up the F word with you, and that is fracking. And, uh, and your view on it. I'm, I'm just looking in front of me here, just getting a lot of comments about this. Uh, Sean says, for instance, 
We are dependent on foreign powers for almost everything. And uh, it's a su suicidal pursuit of net stupid, which net zero was talking about there, makes things worse every day. Be like America, frack or get ready for regular power cuts. And I'll just add another one, uh, Mia. Start fracking immediately. Stop penalising oil companies that explore and produce more British oil immediately. Um, so basically, make energy a national priority, which is what you're, you're trying to do there. But the F word, fracking, what's the future of fracking under Labour? So, for example, in Wales, we don't have fracking and we won't be having it in England either. And what your um, correspondents there have outlined is exactly what we're planning to do um, to secure energy. You know, this is this is all about taking back control of our national energy security so that we have homegrown, clean energy. And as well as that, at the same time, we are creating jobs right across the country, jobs that will make the economy grow, that will bring in more um, taxes through into our treasury, which can then be invested in things like public services. So uh, it will cut bills for good for households and businesses as well. So there is something for everybody here. And it's but at the heart of it is securing our energy security so that we're not reliant yes. on overseas supplies. Uh, a result of that or a byproduct of that Secretary of State is um, pylons. And um, I don't need to go into much detail with you, but basically, whether it's offshore, whether it's nuclear, whatever, our existing uh, electricity grid cannot transport this in the volume required around the country. Now, it's going to take billions of pounds, thousands of miles of new uh, electric pylons. Eyesore, you could argue they're dangerous as well. What's your take on electric pylons? Well, we have electric pylons in place already. We know we need to increase the capacity of the grid. There are different technologies that can be used, and I'm sure that um, we will be looking at all of those options as part of ramping up the grid, because this isn't something that we can leave any longer. The Tories have done nothing on it for 14 years. It is causing a problem in terms of energy security. You know, that is why we're still having to import energy from abroad. You know, our plan will mean that we take back control of our national energy security, and we do that through Great British Energy, publicly owned, so the profits that are earned to go back into government for the benefit of the taxpayer. And would you live close to nearby or have one in your back garden, an electricity pylon? I did actually used to live in a house that was right next to an electricity pylon. Um, I don't think they'd fit in anyone's back garden, though. Well, I've seen them in back gardens, yeah. Uh, we, we've been you that you must have seen a very big back garden. In Northern <laughs> Ireland, I'll tell you. It was, it's quite a small back garden as well. But, um, OK, thank you very much indeed, Secretary of State. Very good talking to you and uh, outlining you. Uh, your plans, Not Labour's plans. Not Secretary of State yet, Shadow Secretary of State. Shadow Secretary Soon of State. Soon to be, possibly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> um, thank right. you very much for your time this morning, Joe. Um, thank you. The thoughts of a political correspondent, James Hill, who's been listening to all of that uh, in the wings. Um, first of all, what do you make about their plans for, for getting Putin's boot off our throat, as they put it. Well, I think it's Labour's plan to really rebrand what they're doing in sort of patriotic tones, also using the language like take back control, obviously trying to appeal no. to a lot of those sort of 2019 voters who abandoned Labour. Uh, and so it's about trying to repackage all of this kind of stuff. Uh, and I think obviously a lot of it's quite sensible in the sense of actually we need to ensure we have energy security, trying to deal things more like nuclear energy, etc. The only question I would also say is what about these, fig these question marks over the costs? So there's a new policy exchange report out today suggesting that their plans to go completely decarbonise for energy by 2020. 30 is going to cost 116 billion. That's many more billions than Labour say it will. The point is, there's going to be a big debate about this figures, and it could be one of those issues where we Although get another U-turn. She's trying to imply this would be a public-private partnership, and there'll be lots of investment from the private sector, and just a small proportion of that would come well, from the government. Even so, and we think we know the legacy of these unfortunate uh, public yeah. joint infrastructure <laughs> projects uh, that actually they don't intend up being like that. So uh, I think it's going to be one to watch in case of another U-turn potentially. Uh, what about what she had to say about um, Mr Gething's donations? Um, she wasn't having a bar of that, was she, that there was anything wrong there? No, of course. I mean, party donation story is the big, uh, long-running sore of British politics, really, uh, and that, unfortunately, the only thing that's more unpopular in the current system is state uh, donations of parties. Uh, no, no voters ever want to back that. So I think it's going to be one big question. And something as Labour gets close to the election, they're going to have more questions on is people mm. who are the funding the campaigns. It used to be about the unions. Now it's about these donors and what their histories are. Well, the other big news of the morning, we spoke to the government just before 7 o'clock, didn't we, um, mm. about their um, 
sort of plans to boost our nuclear defences um, and protect us against Putin. What did you make of what they announced today? Is it particularly different from what they've told us before? Well, it's really a continuation of all of that, really. And I think that what we've seen under Rishi Sunak has been a belated focus on energy security. And I think Eamon was saying earlier, you know, we should have much more of this during the coalition days when Nick Clegg released that video about saying we wouldn't have nuclear power because it wouldn't come online until 2022. Thank God, if only we'd had that during mm. the Ukraine war. Uh, so I think that energy security, there's something that's really been a focus of Claire Coutinho and Sunak, uh, but it might be a little bit too little too late. And that can fortunately be the epitaph for this mm. government in lots of different ways. Um, and I was making the point um, to Mr Bowie, um, the minister, energy minister, mm. that, you know, all this investment in, you know, physical defence, nuclear deterrence, whatever it might be, is all very well and good. But at least two of our newspapers this morning talking about cyber attacks, mm. one in relation to the royals, which we're going to talk to about a bit more in a moment, and the other in relation to democracy here in the UK, the front of the sun, uh, China hack attack on UK, and this was the Electoral Commission being targeted in 2022. Of course, facing an election year, do you think we're doing enough to protect ourselves on uh, I mean, it's, it's a belated focus again. There's a, these, Tom Tuganat's launched this new Defending Democracy Task Force as the security minister, and it's great to see that we are taking it seriously. We've got some of the best uh, spooks in the world at GCHQ, mm. some of the best security. But that being said, we've got lots of vulnerable places like the NHS, for instance, outdated technology being used there. James, we had Greg's go offline, didn't we, last week when we were on air? <laughs> well, I mean, th this is where they're practicing, they're <laughs> playing with us. We had Sainsbury's, McDonald's, Tesco's, I think, Greg's. The Electoral Commission, the Royals. They're What's taking next? out all our national institutions, What's including next? Greg's, you know, the true <laughs> crown jewels of the UK. I mean, that is a serious issue, and that is why I think we're going to see a lot more of this kind of conversation towards the end of the year, because, you know, all across the world, I think three quarters of the world's democracy is going to the polls. Uh, and obviously, people like Russia and China are going to be looking to see where they can find the weak spots in those different mm. systems. James, top man, thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. Good hearing from you. Thank you very much. Uh, here's what else is coming into the newsroom on this Monday morning. Families of the Nottingham University students Barnaby Weber, Grace O'Malley Kumar and caretaker Ian Coates will find out today whether the Crime Prosecution Service was wrong to accept their killer's plea of manslaughter instead of pressing on with murder charges. The teenagers were stabbed to death on a night out in Nottingham last June. In Moscow, three suspects in Friday's deadly concert hall shooting have been in prison for two months as they await trial. A total of 11 people were detained following the attack. Russia's made unsubstantiated claims that they were attempting to escape across the border into Ukraine. US intelligence services believe the attack was carried out by a branch of the Islamic State terror group known as ISIS-K. Meanwhile, Russia's Black Sea Fleet is now functionally inactive, according to UK Defence Secretary Grant Shapps after a massive Ukrainian missile strike on Sevastopol. Security sources have told us that UK-supplied Storm Shadow missiles were used. A major military communications centre has also been damaged. This marks the longest attack on the Russian-controlled port in the war so far, as tensions continue to escalate. And despite a cost of living crisis, the British public donated a record £13.9 billion to charity in 2023. That's a 9% increase on the year before. Uh, and average monthly donations have increased by nearly 40% to £65. Uh, this report was produced by the Charities Aid Foundation and they found that the country's least affluent areas were among the most generous as a proportion of household income. I want to talk about a Coronation Street actor, Dan Brocklebank, and this is about vet bills, and we're going to be talking about this in an hour's time on the programme. So he has got a, a little dash on called Jean, and Jean was ill, and he had to pay, he was hit with a bill of over £2,000. Right, so now all, all this comes down to veterinary practices now being owned, being bought over and owned by big pharmaceutical companies. And he was subscribed or, or prescribed, sorry, uh, tablets, uh, which cost him £26.90. Uh, it turned out they were just paracetamol and they're available from the chemist mm. at 38p each. So um, he took uh, Jean to an out-of-hours vet. He was charged £500 to admit her. Uh, it was an emergency, so he had to pay it. And I think people often pay anything for their pet because... They just love, love it so much. So um, so she, he was then charged another £1,500 for an X-ray and an oxygen mm. tent. And uh, anyway, it came to £2,100, mm. his overall bill. 
Come on. I want to know who's profiting in all of this. Is it the pharmaceutical companies? Pharmaceutical if you're company. a vet, um, get in touch with us this morning because the vets that I know, not particularly well paid, incredibly hard working, long hours, a fairly thankless task, a lot of it quite sad work, quite difficult work because they have to be able to treat everything from a hamster to a cow. Why do you say they're not particularly well paid? Okay, I would say well compared paid. to doctors, if you think of the level of qualification studying involved, doctors are disproportionately paid more than, say, a vet. And yet, really? if you were in a crisis, Actually, a vet is legally allowed to operate on a human, whereas a human a doctor would never be allowed to operate legally on an animal. They're so well qualified, our vets, and so it's so hard to be a vet. Um, so let us know: Are you making money from this as, as vets? These huge markups in prices. Who are the who are the sort of naughty people in all this? I suppose is what the I'm big, trying to big, get to. Big the big farmer. pharmaceutical companies, and um, they're being bought over more and more. They're all becoming chains. I mean, this is a, a, a problem. I think with all. Our businesses around the country. Uh, you look. There's there's a lovely town in Ireland called Westport, and the amazing thing is you go down the street, the main street in Westport, and all the shops look the same. They all look the same. And you think, gosh, and behind the facade of each shop is a Boots, is a McDonald's, is a KFC, whatever, whatever. But you don't know that. Mm. You don't know that because they're all made to look. Is that a bit like Regent Street in London, where they have to all look sort of uniform despite all their big brands? It's just the one street, isn't it, in, in London that the King does that on, where all the big logos have to go in a certain way. It looks nice well, and uniform. All the big logos yeah. have gone, and I think that's very good. I think the problem with our country is that um, you used to be able to travel anywhere, Barcelona, you know, Milan, whatever, mm. and you would take back something that you couldn't get back in Britain. Now you get everything. Everything's mm. the same everywhere. <laughs> uh, the world is just becoming the same. Mm. Uh, I don't think that's very good. And I think that, um, you know, Cleethorpes looks the same as Clacton. And so it goes round the place. Make the, make, we should make our towns and our villages distinctive. That's what mm. we should really do. But big business, capitalisation is everywhere. One market mm. for the whole world. Um, what's your view on that? Let us know. In the meantime, you say good morning to Marco. He's got your weather. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello, here's your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. After a quieter end to the weekend, things are turning more unsettled, I'm afraid. Once we head through the new working week, further spells of wind and rain to come across all areas. And that wet and windy weather is already pushing across western and southwestern parts of the UK. I think as we go through the day today, we could see some particularly heavy rain across the southwest of England. And that will start to turn to snow as it reaches colder air north of the central belt across parts of Scotland, especially later on this afternoon. Towards the southeast, we'll see the best of the brightness, although there will be some brighter skies towards the far northeast of Scotland, coupled with some wintry showers too. In that sunshine in the southeast, we'll peak at 12 Celsius, 54 in Fahrenheit, but it will be a colder afternoon towards the north. Turning very uh, unsettled across Scotland then as we go through the overnight period tomorrow night into Tuesday. A warning comes into a force at midnight because see some heavy rain at low levels, snow across the hills, up to 20 centimetres or so of snow as by the time we get into Tuesday morning. And elsewhere it's a fairly mixed picture, some clear spells but also showers or longer spells of rain never too far away. But those temperatures generally hold up, at least away from the north where we will see a bit of a frost. Into Tuesday then, certainly through the morning, a very unsettled picture once again across Scotland. Further rain and snow to come, snow again mainly on the hills. And elsewhere it's a case of sunshine, but with showers or longer spells of rain once again never too far away. And the temperatures will be struggling on Tuesday, no better at, uh, than uh, 10 or 11 Celsius towards the south. 11 is 52 in Fahrenheit, nearer 4 or 5 degrees in the north. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Now, time is ticking on your chance to win lots of garden gadgets, uh, shopping spree and £12,345 in tax-free cash. The lines are going to close on Friday. That is the end of your chance to enter this one, so make sure you get in. Here are the details. Good luck. Want to be a winner just like Phil? Obviously, whoever wins it next is going to be 
as happy as I was. And they're going to get even more money this time round. So why wouldn't you go in the draw? Enter our massive spring giveaway. There's £12,345 in tax-free cash to give your finances a spring boost. We'll also send you on a shopping spree with £500 worth of vouchers to spend in the store of your choice. You'll also get a garden gadget package. You have to hurry as lines close at 5pm on Friday. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. Still to come with a rise in online harassment and disinformation, the question is... Do we need stricter online regulations? We'll be debating that next, right here on Breakfast. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria Di Piero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. We are going to talk now about uh, online information and disinformation uh, and uh, this particular debate has arisen because of the royal family and the wave of conspiracies over the past couple of weeks on the Princess of Wales. Yes, and it's not just the royals who are facing the brunt of internet trolls. A new report today from the online safety charity Internet Matters has revealed 77% of girls aged 13 to 16 have reported harmful digital experiences. Not only that, some parents now uh, even see the harassment of girls online as normal. 
So this morning, we're asking whether we need stricter rules for social media. At two sides of this argument, Samantha Lee Howe thinks social media does need stricter rules, but the commentator and weight loss coach Steve Miller wants to protect freedom of speech. Um, and I think it's interesting, Steve, from your point of view, because where do you stop? Where do you draw the line? It's awful. And, you know, it's terrible. I mean, and if you could, you would smack somebody in the mouth, really, if you could uh, with this, but you can't. So do we then... There just couldn't be enough people to police what we're talking about here, surely? Well, you know, we, we already have the community standards. These rules are already in place. I've got a set of them here from one platform, and it, and it actually talks about abuse and harassment, that you may not share abusive content, engage in the targeted harassment of someone, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, which, of course, is quite right. So, so the rules are already in place, and I think, too enhance the rules even more deeply is is going to prevent free speech and censorship is you know it, it, it's it's a bit worrying if you're going to censor people from having an opinion and i think actually that also includes speculation speculation to me is a form of opinion so i do think we have to be careful yes there are some people online that call people names and and i get it all the time i get it about the size of my forehead for example i wouldn't uh, could get a rosette on that best in show however you know there are also there is also the point if you're going to put yourself out there you're not going to get everyone agreeing with you you are going to get some banter and sometimes you're going to get some name calling my view on name calling for me in particular and and i would say for other people is you have to get over it or you or you just don't go on social media. I think it I think it would be damning to say we've got to get even tighter. I mean, we've already got the rules. What do we want to what do we then say? You, mm. you know, do we sort of list everything you're not allowed to say on social media? Well, let's get Samantha Lee Howe's reaction to this, um, because, you know, there we have the argument saying that this is banter, sometimes a bit of name calling. But I mean, over the weekend, we saw this anonymous troll behind a lot of the really vindictive and damaging uh, allegations, speculation about the Princess of Wales being unmasked, and rightly so. I mean, the harms can be significant, can't they? Absolutely. And one of the biggest problems that I have, of course, Steve, yes, you're absolutely right. We do have rules and regulations, but the biggest problem there is that a lot of social media sites are not actually enforcing them. When you put in a complaint um, and you claim that something's fake news, usually what comes back is, uh, no, we don't agree, because it is uh, moderated by an AI bot and not by a human being. The situation with Kate, of course, is absolutely appalling. I mean... Uh, it's all very well and good sharing memes that are funny because a pitch was posted um, that was slightly, more, you know, slightly um, photoshopped and inaccurately. Um, but the poor lady has been ill. And anybody who knows about, you know, abdominal surgery for women, it takes many, many months to get better. And the fact that some troll out there did decide to have a go and make spread a lot of fake news was absolutely despicable. And that should stop. I mean, there's nothing wrong with freedom of speech. I agree completely with Steve on that. We need to have freedom of speech. And there is a certain amount of um, putting up with an awful lot of things that you have to when you put yourself out there on social media. But should we have to put up with them, really? Should we? I mean, that's a big question. I don't think we should. I think it should stop. Would you walk into a room and see a person and say some of the things directly to their face that you say on social media? I know I certainly wouldn't do either. How would you police it, though, Samantha? I think it has to be down to the social media um, servers now. I think they have to take responsibility for it because that's the only way we could police it. There are rules for newspapers. There are rules for... And, and of course, the the... the bodies who run the newspapers have to ad adhere to those rules. So maybe it's that's the first line of call. Yeah, what do, you, what do you make it. about that? I mean, Steve, this idea that parents are now just considering harassment of their daughters as just standard, I mean, is that the standard we now have to accept? Well, it says a lot about the parents, doesn't it? It mm. says a lot about the parents. If I had children, if I was lucky enough to have children, I would be monitoring what they're doing on social media. Yes, absolutely, it's wrong to be harassing children. But as what, a parent, what can that's they do also about my, it, Steve? That's, How can they take it my, a step that, further? That's that's also my responsibility as a parent. And I tell you one thing: if I was seeing that children can get harassed on social media, my children wouldn't be on social media. 
So, so I, I, I get it. I understand it. And we all agree that it's wrong. But, but you know, what we've got to be careful of, if we start going down the road of you're not allowed to say this, you're not allowed to say that, you're not allowed to say this, I mean, we, we'll all, it will be a, an authoritarian state. But as for the uh, harassing kids, of course it's wrong. Of course it's wrong. But parents should step up and to the mark sort it. Mm. OK, guys, thanks very much indeed. You've, uh, we've posed the question. Uh, people will have their views on that. GBviews at gbnews.com. Uh, Steve Miller and uh, Samantha Lee Howe, thank you both very much indeed. What annoys me most about social media at the moment is how they predict what you like. So I watch football, but I get nothing but football, mm. uh, whatever they're called, mm -hmm. messages, memes, I don't know what they're called. And then cars, and then what else do I get on? Oh, houses. I'm not getting things on the right. houses a lot. I just think I like the idea of general, the idea yeah. that I can, oh, I like a bit of yeah. that, or I didn't know about I making know. dollies. Or... I do not want to be in a vacuum where all I see is what I like already. I want to know yes. about everything, yes. the whole world. If you want to know about everything, social media is not the place to go. <laughs> yes, but they, but they, they, they do that by then looking at your, your tastes or what mm. you tend to click on and then you're giving nothing else. Mm. And this idea of always asking for, uh, to proceed with this, we would like your email address. Why? Well, Why? I think it's because it's an, an age thing, because I've not encountered I don't mean what, that. My, yeah. what my email's got to do with my yeah. age. You yeah. can have an email Identity. at any age. Yeah. But um, and, and they do ask your age and they, mm. they don't ask your age, they say... When is your birthday? As if they care. <laughs> um, no, no, just bugger off. Really, that's what you want to say. Yeah, Isn't it? I mean, I think the trouble with social media, from my point of view, is it knows what my weaknesses are, and it's basically selling me things. And so then I can't basically go onto social media to look at pictures of my friends' kids without ending up accidentally yes. buying a candlestick yes. that I didn't yes. need. Imagine That's being sold problem. Paul Coit day nah. after day. Really. Oh. oh, goodness me, imagine. All my adverts are all coming for, like, over 60s, over 70s. <laughs> I don't want they one of those... They know us so well. I don't want one of those <laughs> things to put my two feet in that's going to keep my feet warm for a while. You know, I'm getting a bit worried. I don't need those, those special incontinence pants. I don't want them. I don't not need yet. them, I swear. Just not yet. you wait. And then do you not think, but what if? Maybe I should. <laughs> maybe. What if? Just what to be in there, because they what do if? look quite comfortable, actually. So maybe I'll get myself well, some What have you got for us today to make us wet up hands? I tell you what I have. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I nearly did. Excuse me. Um, we're going to learn things. Oh. We're going to learn things. The difference between a lots a Salco and everything else to do with ice skating because a new ice skating world record has been set. Oh. So that sounds very right. good, right. doesn't it? A cliffhanger a, a, exactly. Right a little bit of England and also a bit of Andy Murray as well. We'll do that. Okay, next. we'll be dancing around all of that after this. Please don't go away. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other, which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise and who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, 
GB News is Britain's election channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Sal we're, we're super Salco in... Salco and a Lutz. Right, OK. And so we're talking those, about ice all of those skating. Things. Yeah, should we do the, we do the ice skating? Ice skating, 19-year-old Ilya Melanin mm. is from Virginia. Not... Well, he sounds a little Russian, but he's, he's American. OK. And he set a new world record for the greatest score in ice... Now, his hair is not normally like that. That's because he's actually spent... Oh, look wow. at that. Look at that leg there. Honestly, he is an amazing ice skater. Free skates at a new world record. 227.79. Forget John Curry and Robin Cousins. Even forget Dick Button. That's what I say. This guy is the future of the sport. So... What is, what is Dick Button? Dick Button was a famous ice skater from the 1950s and 60s. Oh, no, You're not familiar no. with the work of Dick no, Button? No, 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 I'm not, I'm not. No, no, no. Dick Button was great. Mm. Um, anyway, he did six quadruple jumps Gosh. in one programme. So that's up four times that round. No, the, well, um. the thing is, there are, he did do a quad axle. Now, have you heard of an axle? Because mm. they say there's an axle. We have a picture, I believe, of Axel Paulsen, who was the man that invented the axle for Norway. There he is, there's Axel. What, 1890s. Gosh. Uh, it's a forward jump from the edge of the skate, and uh, Ilya did it four times. So that's Axel. That's where the Axel, Axel Paulsen. The other one, he did a quad Lutz. Are you still with me? Yes, I'm yeah. sure you've talked so, to us about Lutz before. I have mentioned Lutz yes. before, but I haven't gone in detail to the right. Lutz, which I'm about to do, which is the second hardest jump, nearly as hard as the Axel. This is Alois Lutz. Can we see Alois Lutz? From 1913, he's an Austrian who... There he is. That's him. He looks like he's falling over, but he's complete control of his skates. It's a toe-pick jump, which starts with the back outside edge landing on the outside edge of the other foot. Invented by Alois Lutz in 1913. Gosh. And the other thing he did was a quad loop, which is easy, and then a quad salco. Mm. And the salco is named after Ulrich Salco. And here's Ulrich. Can we see Ulrich there? Look at Ulrich. Oh, how swell. Oh, he's quite flighty, isn't he, there, Ulrich? Look at that. That's how he just stands, just for fun. Look at him. Um, Ulrich Salco, 1909, back outside to the back outside. So all those jumps were done four times, a new world record, and it was the greatest skate ever seen. Wow. Well, it is an amazing thing. I mean, I, I, I look at things like that, and because I've always had sort of hip problems, I, I, even balancing... Would be amazing. You're a long way away from that quad Salco at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah yeah, yeah. 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 Incredible. Okay. Well, congratulations to him. Yeah. Absolutely. For that. And I'd like to say congratulations for me for getting through most of the. All those congratulations. Names. And the lights. You know, I'm not, I don't want to big myself up, but a Lutz and a Salco and a triple toe loop. Brilliant, mate. It's been the highlight Brilliant. of my career. Thanks very much, <laughs> my friend. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. See you again at uh, 20 past. I minutes. hope so. Thank you very much. Still to come, we'll be taking a look at what's making the news uh, in the company of Don Neeson, the newspaper editor, and Christopher Biggins, the phenomenal. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday. Can you just let us know if, if there have been people getting into contact with you as a local councillor about how they feel about every lamppost, which is supposed to be public, mm. neutral territory, being covered in these flags? Has it made some of your constituents nervous to walk the streets? 
it's a complete range of people, including people who are from the Bangladeshi Muslim community who support who support the um, endeavours of what's going of, of Gaza, of what is going on, and are hostile to the actions of the Israeli government, but feel that they shouldn't have these flags on the streets. I thought if you walk down some of the streets, it doesn't look like a London borough. It looks almost like what you would imagine in Ceausescu's Romania with flags on every street. Well, well, Peter, can you let us know? Uh, what it's like in the council and their activities in Tower Hamlets. How much time, for example, has been spent discussing issues relating to what's happening in the Middle East? Has it dominated quite a lot of time? No. Um, let's be absolutely fair to the mayor and the administration. There's a heck of a lot to do in this council. We have extremes of deprivation and, um, of course, wealth because of the Canary Wharf and City Fringe. We have huge problems on the council. And to be fair, the council spends its time doing council matters. And they said initially, in fact, absolutely carefully at council meetings, we can't interfere with foreign policy, but we've got a lot to do on national policy and local policy. Let's concentrate on that. So there hasn't been too much pressure that you can see from people living in the borough for the council to take a stance? Members of the council and the administration have... have um, Put their support. As I've said, we're talking of free speech. They're entitled to do that, but it's what happens where the council is responding to absolutely everybody, all 320,000 people who live in our borough. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Uh, right, stories that are that are featuring in the news today, and uh, we're going to touch upon those now with Christopher Biggins and Don Neeson. And uh, Christopher, in the Sun today, um, they they talk about diets. What are they saying about diets? Well, what they're saying is that diets, and I think this is true, funnily enough, are far more difficult for women than men. I mean, I think women, I, I think it's a real problem for women uh, to diet. They seem to what it's top of their agenda, whereas I don't think men really, as you get older, think about it. Well, if we look at you and me, you can tell we're obsessed. <laughs> we're obsessed with the whole subject. Um, You're both yeah. fine figure of strapping a young Yeah, but I think men. men can get away with it. You know, I mean, we don't... Ha I certainly... Well, you definitely get to wear blazers and things, which are great tailoring and hide a multitude of things. Not in your case. No, but, but you're right, you're the right there. The but, I've, you know, I've always been big, and, I, you know, and I've been on diets, you know, but I, I, I hate them. Diets, I think, are the worst thing. There's only one, one way to lose weight. That's eat less and exercise. Mm. Well, I'm eating much less and I'm just getting bigger. <laughs> It's true. Is it, is, it, uh, is it medication? What is it? I, I, think, yeah, I think you've hit the nail on the yeah. head. There's joking aside, medication you can take when you get older, certainly as a man and as a woman, medication makes a difference. Your metabolism changes as well. It does slow down. There's nothing any of us can do about that. Yeah. Oh, um, and and sort of like, you know, it doesn't matter. You can eat as little as you like and you still find it much, much harder to lose weight. I think the serious side of this story, though, is the fact that when men get older, um, there are other health issues that come into. Uh, account into play that you need to be aware of about losing weight. Type 2 diabetes being the big one at the moment and that's why men do need to be more aware of their weight well, and, I tell and you, healthy I, eating. I'll go out and I'll limit them on what and I'll say women are probably generally bigger than men. Um, I, I just think the amount of... It's very hard to be in a gathering or walk down the street and not see not big women, 
huge women. I mean, I think I'm big, but nothing compared to some of the people I see now who just... Yeah, I no, agree with no you. standard. I, it's, but the thing is, does this bring it all back to the, the fact that we find it difficult to, te to, to talk about the obesity problem in this country? Because then you're then accused of fat-shaming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, we probably. need to talk about obesity. We need mm. to talk about it in a non-insulting, non-threatening way, but be aware that there is a problem in this country, mm. even with little kids now being obese. And for people who say, you know, oh, my health is fine, there's nothing wrong, yes, your blood pressure might be fine that day, but it will not be fine no, overall. Yeah. I mean, mm. and to say that there's no health issues with it is, is a denial. It's just yeah. silly. silly. And, but I, I do like the theory that women find it harder. And, I, you know, just to add to, to the list, I can say to my husband, yeah, but you know, it's just naturally, I, I can't stick to the... <laughs> rules. It's the same with sleeping in. Women need more sleep than men, so just let you me stay in bed a bit me. longer. Apparently that's true. I'm well, I'd, I'd agree with that in my experience. Yeah. And also, I think women are generally colder than men. Oh, we are colder. Yeah. That's, that's an mm. actual fact. Yeah. I mean, not just emotionally. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> that's not a fact. Physically as well. <laughs> yeah, but we are. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I'm freezing as well. Yeah, yeah see? Feel that. You, body have temperatures. A feel. I mean, that is weird. That is weird. That <laughs> is weird. Why are you so cold? Our body temperatures are set cooler than yours automatically. Yeah. Is that and to do with reproduction or...? <laughs> it must be, I don't know. Even yeah. though, in my case, it's a bit late, to be honest with you. Mm. To do the whole reproduction I think thing. it's all to do with the fact that women have uh, hearts and men don't. Mm. Cold hands, warm hearts. Oh, oh, oh. That's the one. Uh, right, OK. What right. Right. Let's, let's talk about Dawn. Dawn. Um, it's always where you kick your brains, it's worried me, Biggins. <laughs> let's talk about Kate, cos we haven't talked about her for a while. And, um, what, you know, well, it was seven minutes or so. <laughs> <laughs> have we talked about her in the last little while? I don't feel like we've talked about her for a little while. So, obviously, um, everybody very concerned about her health after her big revelation on Friday. Um, but the front of the Telegraph is really quite shocking. The suggestion that these hostile states, China, China, Russia and Iran are actually trying to destabilize Britain. I was a, a by gobsmacked by this slurs story. about her. Gobsmacked by this story. China and Russia behind slurs on the princess. You know, we've seen all the trolls and start, you know, the media stuff and some of the mad um, conspiracy theories online. And I just thought there were people out there with too much time on their hands and just being a bit nasty. Mm. But it actually seems to be the case that a, you know, a hostile country like China and Russia and Iran could be spreading misinformation and encouraging these theories to destabilise the morale of the country. Mm -hmm. huh? I, think it's, I think it's because they know how much we love our royal family. And I think they, they think this is something that will get at, get at them, to really disabilise them, you know. I mean, it's, it's, it's not good news. But it's, it's not really the royal family that they are looking to destabilise. They're, they're, they're looking to destabilise the country. Yeah. That's the thing. Yeah. And I do think people take a lot of comfort and a lot of uh, sucker from the fact that if everything's OK with the royals, then everything's OK. You're right. Stop. Yeah. It's the morale thing. I remember going to... It's not that boring, this story, honestly. Canterbury <laughs> once. And, Darren, we were told as we walked around Canterbury Cathedral that the Nazis during the Second World War wanted to obliterate Canterbury and the cathedral because it would destroy the morale mm. of the nation. Yes, yes. It never happened, obviously, thankfully, yeah. the cathedral's still there. Mm. But it's like, wow. They yeah. say it really it could, could have that moral yeah. effect. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. find that now in all the wars that are going on, some of the most wonderful buildings oh, we're yeah. losing. Mm. And, you know, I, I, we all love to travel and go and see them, and we're not going to be able to see them soon. Because mm. they're all gone. They don't build buildings like that anymore. They, and I don't think they ever will. Yeah. Uh, Biggins, you want to talk about um, a lot of waiters running through Paris yesterday, <laughs> which I thought was a really stupid story. No, I... And, I, I... and they, they, they carry trays uh, yeah. with a bottle of wine on or a bottle no, of water. No, no, no wine. Right. Water, okay. uh, a croissant and I think a coffee, was it? Mm -hmm. Yes. Espresso, Espresso, darling. yeah, expre espresso. No, they, I'd, have, I'd have put wine on the list. <laughs> I tell you what I think is good about this story. You know, we, or everything we read about Paris and, and France is there's always a riot there, there's always something terrible going on, and this is... Bed bugs. Yeah, exactly. But look, this is... Look at that, look at that man. Uh, Sammy Lamorous uh, running ahead there, uh, beating all the others. I think it's just a fun thing to do. I think we should do it in England. Get some of those waiters out from chic restaurants, you know, we running down the road. We can't get any hospitality any... staff We haven't in got this enough country. staff to be no, spare no, no, no. for that. <laughs> That's <be> true. Silly. <laughs> um, there's nobody available. But I, I just... Uh, I, I think it's a, a nice, fun story for a Monday morning. Absolutely. Um, right, OK, so let's... Uh, 
through through the hay cart over now. Olivia Colman, the actress, the esteemed actress, has say there is big uh, gender pay disparity in the film industry. Um, doesn't surprise you, Dawn, I would imagine? Not at all, absolutely not. I mean, there is still a pay discrepancy in pretty much every single industry. Women are still paid. On average, I think the latest research was, um, on average, this is 7% less than men. Um, and in a lot of cases, it's a lot worse than that. So, yes, there is a huge inequality still, despite supposedly having inequality bills where you're not allowed to discriminate between the sexes. It still happens. And I, I like the story, the headline of most papers today is that it, she says, if I was called Oliver, yeah. I would earn a lot yeah. more yeah. money. And I think she's right, yeah. you know, and I, I think she's, a, she's won Oscars. What does she have to do to get more money? Mm. Sleep with uh, <laughs> Harvey oh, Weinstein. Yeah. Uh, yes, of course. Yeah, yeah. Get him out of prison. Uh, yeah, which is, which is disgusting to think that that actually may be one of the options open to a well, woman. Well, men to... didn't have to do that, did they? It was always the casting couches were traditionally these horrendous toads of men um, taking advantage of young young women. But to be able to command at the top of her game the kind of salary she deserves, it, it's shocking. Have you seen her in Wicked Little Letters? No, I haven't. Is it good? I haven't seen it, but I've seen no. all the posters on the tube. Yeah, it's it good. How fantastic I've seen it. It is, it is really, really funny. Is it's she the star or is there a co-star as well? There's a co-star, yeah. but there was two very strong female characters and it's very much a woman's film. And the other comment she made about this was uh, how women are also discriminated against in swearing. Because there's a lot of swearing in this film, really, including the C word, which is Olivia's favourite word, evidently. Um, yeah, I saw an interview with her uh, talking about that, and she really went up on my estimation. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Mine too. I, I mean, which is her favourite word? I missed it. Not saying it, but the, oh. the C oh. Yeah, the C word. <laughs> oh, right, that's why I missed it. You didn't say word. it. Sorry. But, I mean, she was saying that sort of like if a man <laughs> swears, it's fine, but women swearing, mm. it's, it's like you're looked down upon. You're, you're not quite, you know, it's not that acceptable. My mother, whose birthday is today, she's happy birthday, didn't know the C word mom. until she met Eamon. And well, now... She seemed to learn very quickly. <laughs> she's adopted it somewhat. Well, hold on. Was she calling you the C word, Eamon? I'm just no, saying. No, no, just no. using it in no, general. But, but we had a number of people who had applied to. Well, there's a marvellous series on television now called Mary and George, uh, which is all about James I, and they constantly swear and use the uh, the C word. I mean, it's. Mm -hmm. I think it's coming full circle now. We're coming back to all of that. OK. Well, there it's you go. It's good for you. Swearing Guys, is good for you. Guys, uh, you'll be good for us again when we see you in 40 minutes' time. Thank you. Marco, morning. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello, here's your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. After a quieter end to the weekend, things are turning more unsettled, I'm afraid. Once we head through the new working week, further spells of wind and rain to come across all areas. And that wet and windy weather is already pushing across western and southwestern parts of the UK. I think as we go through the day today, we could see some particularly heavy rain across the southwest of England. And that will start to turn to snow as it reaches colder air north of the central belt across parts of Scotland, especially later on this afternoon. Towards the southeast, we'll see the best of the brightness, although there will be some brighter skies towards the far northeast of Scotland, coupled with some wintry showers too. In that sunshine in the southeast, we'll peak at 12 Celsius, 54 in Fahrenheit, but it will be a colder afternoon towards the north. Turning very uh, unsettled across Scotland then as we go through the overnight period tomorrow night into Tuesday. A warning comes into a force at midnight. We could see some heavy rain at low levels, snow across the hills, up to 20 centimetres or so of snow as by the time we get into Tuesday morning. And elsewhere, it's a fairly mixed picture. Some clear spells, but also showers or longer spells of rain never too far away. But those temperatures generally hold up, at least away from the north, where we will see a bit of a frost. Into Tuesday then, certainly through the morning, a very unsettled picture once again across Scotland. Further rain and snow to come. Snow again mainly on the hills. And elsewhere it's a case of sunshine, but with showers or longer spells of rain once again never too far away. And the temperatures will be struggling on Tuesday. No better at, uh, than uh, 10 or 11 Celsius towards the south. 11 is 52 in Fahrenheit, nearer 4 or 5 degrees in the north. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Want to be a winner just like Phil? Obviously, whoever wins it next is going to be 
as happy as I was. And they're going to get even more money this time round, so why wouldn't you go in the draw? Enter our massive spring giveaway. There's £12,345 in tax-free cash to give your finances a spring boost. We'll also send you on a shopping spree with £500 worth of vouchers to spend in the store of your choice. You'll also get a garden gadget package. You have to hurry as lines close at 5pm on Friday. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 double T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other, which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Big news, big debate, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you... PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Good morning, 8 o'clock, Monday the 25th of March. Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. This is what we've got for you on this Monday morning. A boost to nuclear defence is set to be announced today as the threat of President Putin looms large. Uh, and it's not just Putin. The Deputy Prime Minister Oliver Dowden's raising the alarm over more Chinese cyber attacks as senior MPs and peers are also being targeted. Yes, a more dangerous world, threats growing from both Russia and China. I'll tell you what to expect we're going to hear today very shortly. To you shortly then, Catherine, thank you. Whitehall sources uh, also fear the two nations could be behind the wave of slurs and conspiracies against the Princess of Wales online. Why? A bid to destabilise the UK, it appears. Lollipop men and women are a familiar sight on the school run, but Hampshire County Council's considering plans to sack 21 of them. Plus, as unprecedented vet costs are making pet ownership so unaffordable, we'll be looking at how much owning a pet will actually cost you. How far would you go? How much would you pay? And are the vets ripping us off? Let us know. And in the sport, Andy Murray may well have played his last hard-court match after losing in Miami. More injury worries for Gareth Southgate ahead of the Belgian game tomorrow. And the quickest goal ever in international football has been scored. Hello, good morning. After a fairly quiet end to the weekend weather-wise, I'm afraid the week ahead does look unsettled once again. There'll be further spells of wind and rain at times, and I'll have all the details later.
Leading on this Monday morning, the Prime Minister will declare a new funding scheme to secure the future of, he says, his UK's nuclear industry. He's hoping the new funds will create 40,000 new job roles by the end of the decade. Earlier, we spoke to Minister for Energy Security and Net Zero, Andrew Bayer Bowie. We're going to be creating uh, hundreds of thousands of new high-wage high school jobs, the length and breadth of the country, many in places where high-wage jobs uh, are actually at a premium. And that's why I'm so excited about the investment that we are making today uh, in Sizewell C and Hinkley Point C and a third gigawatt scale project coming down the line after that and our small modular reactor program. This is going to create a whole new uh, range of energy technologies to support our transition to uh, become more energy secure and independent. But yes, it is about creating uh, new new jobs in parts of the country where, where they are desperately needed. This news comes today as the Deputy Prime Minister Oliver Darden is expected to tell Parliament that Beijing is behind a wave of cyber attacks on senior MPs and peers. Well, joining us now is GB News political correspondent Catherine Forster. Uh, good morning to you, Catherine. So whilst the government might want to be talking uh, about nuclear and new jobs there, it seems as though the attention seems to be perhaps a little bit more on cyber security and the threat that's being posed by China, Russia and indeed Iran. Yes, that's right. And good morning, Eamon and Isabel. It does feel like we are living in a more and more dangerous world, doesn't it? So, yes, the government today is keen to focus on nuclear, nuclear power, something uh, which there's a newfound enthusiasm for. Of course, it's only 14 years ago that Nick Clegg, as part of the coalition, was basically saying, oh, well, it takes too long. Uh, effectively, let's not worry about it. But part of energy security, also investing in um, nuclear submarines, lots of concerns about defence spending. But China, too, because... We know that China, we have very close trading relations with them. They're incredibly powerful. But we now uh, discover that they have been involved in uh, hacking attacks. In fact, it's reported that they were able to access the details of 40 million uh, British citizens on the electoral roll in the last couple of years. Um, They've also been targeting MPs that are critical of uh, links we have to China, people including um, former Conservative leader Sir Ian Duncan Smith. And indeed they, these, this group of MPs, uh, having a meeting today um, with security services to, to bring them up to date. But we've come a long way, haven't we, from going back to the coalition government where the red carpet was rolled out for China. David Cameron, George Osborne, the then Chancellor, talking about a golden age of relations with China. Um, that seems to have faded. But the thing is, of course, that we are hugely entangled with China. Uh, taking a tougher line has consequences. So the government trying to um, tread a delicate line. And also, of course, since bringing Lord Cameron in as Foreign Secretary, some saying that the government has softened its approach on China and that that needs to change. OK, Catherine, thanks very much indeed. And it's been revealed today that Whitehall figures fear Russia, China and Iran are fueling online conspiracy theories and disinformation about the Princess of Wales. Yeah, it's on the front of the Telegraph this morning. They're quoting Whitehall sources. It all comes as senior royals are rallying to support the King and the Princess of Wales, both who are now receiving cancer treatment. Uh, Royal editor at Vanity Fair, Katie Nicholl, joins us now. Katie, how credible do you think this accusation is? I think it's pretty credible. I don't think the Telegraph would put anything on the front page that sort of didn't have some substance to it. And, um, you know, I think we've seen this with the Duchess of Sussex as well, these bots, the, these trolls that sort of can't almost be um, attached to a single person, but they're sort of generated and algorithms generated. Um, but the, get that disinformation and that sentiment out there. And I think, actually, when you sit back and consider that at a time when we're two senior members of the royal family down. The monarchy is looking, well, quite frankly, more vulnerable and fragile than it has since the death of Queen Elizabeth, possibly even more so. This disinformation, this sense of unsettling the nation actually has a very deep and profound impact. We don't see it. 
but it does. And talking about how unsettling um, even the, the truth, which is that the Princess Catherine is very unwell. I mean, we were just discussing before we came on air how upset we both were personally yes, about very this much. news on Friday. And I, I was choked up. I yep. think a lot of people were, not only for the Princess of Wales, of course, for her, her little ones, yes. but also for William after everything he's been through. Well, we've sat here before, haven't we, as well, and Eamon, and talked about the Prince of Wales and the pressure on him um, that he's under. I mean, not only must the weight of the Crown hang very heavily on his shoulders at the moment, but he's dealing with a father who's in his 70s and who's clearly not well, his wife now. Um, I think if you put yourself in his position, it's got to be very, very tough indeed. But what I know about the Prince of Wales is that he has the most amazing levels of resilience mm -hmm. and inner strength. And when you consider the tragedy that he faced as a young man and what he's gone through, um, he will be drawing on that strength. He also knows that in his wife, he has one strong woman. And I think what struck so many of us when we saw that unprecedented video message was her level of optimism in all of this. And she believes that she's going to be well and OK. He believes that too. And while the focus is very much on her, he will be that bedrock, that foundation underpinning everything, giving her the reassurance that she needs. And I think she uh, used that word the, herself. The prince, the princess and the king, um, how closely would they be coordinating on all of this? I mean. I'm assuming she just doesn't make this announcement of her own accord. No, and it was unprecedented. You know, a written statement would have been the norm, but she felt that that would just be too difficult for the British public and, and, and the people of the Commonwealth and beyond to accept, and I think she was absolutely right, but that decision wouldn't have been made with, with William, with him backing it. She would certainly have spoken with the King about it, um, and she has obviously had their full support in it, um, and we know that she met with the King after filming that message, so she will have been well supported, but I think this is an example of Catherine doing things her way. And I think when you see how the narrative spun so much out of her control, who wouldn't want to be in front of the camera addressing those people herself mm -hmm. in an independently filmed message? I think it was very important. And, and Katie, no coincidence that it was released after her children had broken up for the Easter holidays, so the kids don't then have to go in and face a barrage of questions from their peers. Thinking about others, even in this difficult moment, she was thinking about her children as well. She was thinking about her children, um, not wanting to, to expose them to any playground gossip. Um, and she was thinking about anyone that's gone through a cancer diagnosis because her parting message in that is, is don't forget there is hope. So even in her inner turmoil and all of that insecurity and fear that she's feeling, she's thinking of her little children, mm. she's thinking of her husband, and she's thinking of everyone who's been touched by this, with a message of hope at the end. When she comes through this, um, mm. she will be the cancer champion, will she not? I mean, that, her and the, the disease will be forever linked and she'll be forever be a, a champion. I hope so. And I think we've seen the princess champion stigmas in many forms, whether that's mental health awareness and issues, um, addiction, tough, tough issues that are still stigmas, even though they affect so many people in society. If one in two people are going to go through a cancer diagnosis, smashing that stigma is a brilliant thing for her to do. Uh, and just lastly, you know, she talked about, well, originally we were told she'd be back pretty much after Easter. Now there's been question marks about Trooping the Colour in June. But given the revelation on Friday night, do you get the sense that everybody's pulling back and saying, you take the year, to, you take as long as you like. Yep. There's not going to be the same pressure and clamour for her to be back in front of the cameras as Absolutely. perhaps they might have been. Absolutely. I mean, conversely, we're hearing that the king um, possibly might be back as soon as well, he is. And, you know, we've talked about that before, his frustration about this recovery being lengthier than he had planned. Look, we have to wait and see how Catherine tolerates this treatment. Some people sail through tablet form chemotherapy, we don't know what she's on. She may very well sail through this. We may see her sooner than we think, but the point is there is no pressure. Yeah. It will be in her time when she's ready. Fabulous. Katie, thank you thank very you. much indeed. Katie, um, as a mum, I'd like to ask you this question. Don't make me cry, Eamon. No, no, no. <laughs> where, do you stand, where do you stand on uh, lollipop people, men and women who do the, uh, the lollipop job outside schools? Uh, they get £11.70 per hour. Um, to do this, but Hampshire Council are looking to make uh, cuts and it would save them a million pounds a year, which is which is nothing really in the council's budget. But uh, what's what's your view on 
Do you think it's a necessity? Do you think it should be a voluntary uh, position? What, what's your view? I think they're absolute essential. And I remember my lollipop lady from when I was at school. Yeah. And, I'm, you know, when I'm running around doing the school run, when I'm not here with you guys in the mornings, I think... I wish that school had a lollipop man or lady because yeah. they need it, because nothing is more important than the safety of our children. OK. Hey, so bring hey, them sure. back and keep them where they are. And look after we're them. Going Absolutely. To, uh, we're going to talk about that now, and that's why I just wanted to gauge your, uh, your opinion on all of this. So it's Hampshire County Council. Sacking, uh, they, they have 21 lollipop men and women on their staff, and uh, they're saying, right, we need to save a million quid, so we'll get rid of mm. those people. Yeah, the council says there aren't enough pedestrian and vehicle movements to warrant the cost of some patrols which operate at pick-up and drop-off at schools. <laughs> Parents very worried about this, understandably. No, they argue that measures such as this could endanger the lives of their children, and here's a report from uh, our southwest of England uh, correspondent, Jeff Moody. <laughs> Sharon Woodford has been guiding children across this street in Holbury in Hampshire for 32 years. She's phenomenal. She's phenomenal. She knows every single child by their name. So it doesn't matter how old they are. <laughs> it doesn't matter how old they are or anything. Yeah, she's been amazing. I don't know how I remember their names, but I do. You must really care. Yes, I do. And it'd be a shame to see it go, but what do you do? You know? Sharon's been told she may be losing her job, as the council says the road's not busy enough to warrant her salary. And she's not alone. 21 lollipop men and women in Hampshire are facing the chop in cost-cutting measures that may mean the end of school crossing patrols altogether. Parents are angry. Um, I think it's ridiculous. Um, she's here every day, twice a day, getting us across this road safely. It's the main road to go through this area. Uh, a lot of the kids that go to that school, they, they walk on their own from that direction, so they're on their own. So I just think that with all the money flying around in the world at the moment, the least they could do is afford to fund this wonderful person and get us across the road. Like many councils, Hampshire County Council says it's running out of cash. They say they have a hole in their budget to the tune of £132 million. After coming for 21 lollipop men and women, the remaining 163 school crossing patrols could be removed as well. In a statement, Hampshire County Council said, whilst we have a legal duty to promote road safety and take measures to prevent accidents, there is no specific legal requirement for us to provide school crossing patrols, of which there are currently 184 in Hampshire. We know that local communities value their school crossing patrol officers, and this is not a reflection on individuals undertaking that role. But there may be effective alternatives for some sites, such as installing permanent safety measures or improvements to make a crossing point safer. But locals say these cuts put their children's lives at risk. I think it's stupid because this road can be very fast, very fast. And like a lot of, load of the kids just come flying across. And she's there. She, she's like the safety hub of the road. Hampshire County Council says 13 services are facing cuts, from household waste recycling centres to bus services. Parents in Holbury have got together a petition to try and save Sharon Woodford's job. The council says it hasn't made any firm decisions yet and will only remove the service if a crossing can be made safe. Lollipop men and women have been a mainstay outside our schools for seven decades. For many, they're as British as fish and chips. But if councils can't balance their books, these stalwarts at our school gates may become a thing of the past. Jeff Moody, GB News. Think about that, a thing of the past. Mm. Um, well, let's hope not. Um, if this was my area, says Diane, uh, I'd be able to make a few suggestions. Dance days, art around the city, surfboarding lessons for foster families and many other follies. Look at what services used to be provided when council tax was affordable. So I think what she's saying is you could get rid of a lot of these and save the lollipop mm. people uh, at the same time. Yeah. It's, it's about 5,000 quid a year um, that they, they would cost. Yeah, Stanley's saying these money-wasting councils should take a good look at themselves, start by sacking all of the useless jobs worth so, so happily harbour. Yeah. Say what you really think, Stanley. <laughs> yeah, but you have to say what you think, Stanley, because um, th there is a difference between things we need in life and things we don't need. Mm -hmm. Now, the council are making a decision there that we don't need those mm. lollipop people about. Um, I think most of you would argue 
there's always the possibility of something going wrong, a uh, bad driver out right there, um, just somebody who's putting an arm around the children and saying, we'll get you across here, everything will be OK, tell your parents not to worry. OK, 16 minutes past the hour of 8 o'clock. I'm also going to say, coming up very, very shortly, uh, we've got vets and how much they charge and why they charge what they charge. And it appears that local independent vets are going out of business and they're all going to be owned by chains, big chains uh, who are behind a lot of this and a lot of them American. Stories coming into the newsroom, this is what we've got. Uh, the families of the Nottingham University students Barnaby Webber and Grace O'Malley Kumar plus the caretaker Ian Coates will find out today whether the Crown Prosecution Service was wrong to accept their killer's plea of manslaughter instead of pressing on with murder charges. The teenagers were stabbed to death on a night out in Nottingham last June. In Moscow, three suspects in Friday's deadly concert hall shootings have been imprisoned for two months. A total of 11 people were detained following the terror attack and these people are in jail until their trial will be held. So uh, Russia is saying the shooties were attempting to escape across the border into Ukraine. UK US intelligence services believe the attack was carried out by a branch of Islamic State. And despite a cost of living crisis, the British public donated a record £13.9 billion to charity in 2023. That's a 9% increase on the year before. Average monthly donations increased uh, by nearly 40%. And the report from the Charities Aid Foundation found that the country's least affluent areas gave the most generously. I noticed something this morning, not so much the weather, but the atmosphere. It was brighter, mm. brighter. And you know how early I come in in the morning. Yeah. Well, you know, I heard the bird song before even dawn had broken, which means that dawn is getting closer to breaking as I come in. So fingers crossed, summer is on the way. It certainly felt like it this weekend. I actually lay out in the sun yesterday, admittedly with a hoodie on, but Did when you? the sun was shining, it was warm. It was warm. So you heard the bird song. Mm. What's that song? Morning has broken. <laughs> I thought you were going to say, why do birds suddenly appear? <laughs> Every time. I can't go that high. You Morning. are near. <laughs> anyway, um, Marco Britannia has our forecast and he can tell us uh, okay. whether we'll have more bird song. Marco, my man. Sunshine. A brighter outlook with Box Solar. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello, here's your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. After a quieter end to the weekend, things are turning more unsettled, I'm afraid, once we head through the new working week. Further spells of wind and rain to come across all areas, and that wet and windy weather is already pushing across western and southwestern parts of the UK. I think as we go through the day today, we could see some particularly heavy rain across the southwest of England, and that will start to turn to snow as it reaches colder air north of the central belt across parts of Scotland, especially later on this afternoon. Towards the southeast, we'll see the best of the brightness, although there will be some brighter skies towards the far northeast of Scotland, coupled with some wintry showers too. In that sunshine in the southeast, we'll peak at 12 Celsius, 54 in Fahrenheit, but it will be a colder afternoon towards the north. Turning very uh, unsettled across Scotland then as we go through the overnight period tomorrow night into Tuesday. A warning comes into a force at midnight because we see some heavy rain at low levels, snow across the hills, up to 20 centimetres or so of snow as by the time we get into Tuesday morning. And elsewhere it's a fairly mixed picture, some clear spells but also showers or longer spells of rain never too far away. But those temperatures generally hold up, at least away from the north where we will see a bit of a frost. Into Tuesday then, certainly through the morning, a very unsettled picture once again across Scotland. Further rain and snow to come, snow again mainly on the hills. And elsewhere it's a case of sunshine, but with showers or longer spells of rain once again never too far away. And the temperatures will be struggling on Tuesday, no better at, uh, than uh, 10 or 11 Celsius towards the south. 11 is 52 in Fahrenheit, nearer 4 or 5 degrees in the north. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Breaking news coming in uh, this morning as I speak. The Great British Giveaway competition. Uh, the doors will close. Everything will close on Friday. Yes. And uh, so if you're not in, you could be in trouble. And that's where Isabel and I come in. Yes, because you could win seasonal gadgets. We're talking about spring gadgets. Things spring like an uni gadgets. pizza oven for your garden. Plus uh, cash 
that is tax-free to the tune of £12,345. Have a go. It's the final week to see how you could win big. You could win an amazing £12,345 in tax-free cash that you could spend however you like. Plus, there's a further £500 of shopping vouchers to spend at your favourite store. We'll also give you a gadget package to use in your garden this spring. That includes a games console, a pizza oven and a portable smart speaker so you can listen to GB News on the go. You have to hurry as lines close at 5pm on Friday. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE19T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. Well, Friday, you have been warned, it finishes on Friday, then we'll do a new one for the next month. But anyway, £12,345, all yours. Uh, stay with us, Paul Coit will be in the studio, he'll have all your sports news. That's next, right here on Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Deeps and Co, weekdays from 6pm. You think this country needs new gas power stations? Apparently, this will all be about trying to get some form of energy security. Rishi Sunak has upset people today with this suggestion. People saying that actually this would do more damage to climate change uh, than it would do good. Where are you on it, Richard? Uh, I'll tell you exactly where we need a lot more gas power stations and nuclear power stations because quite often the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine. Last week, we imported 16% of all our electricity because we haven't got enough capacity in the UK and we're now totally over-reliant on renewables. Um, the part of the problem is the lack of storage capacity, which mm. the government has finally got round to addressing. I think this as backup is actually quite a sensible idea. But they are not doing anything, as far as I can tell. At the moment, it will be retrofitted to have storage capability, which seems to be utterly bonkers. I mean, anyone who's got solar panels, um, you know, you know very well you're storing up energy. So it's about storage as much as production. And they could have gone, you know, 20 years ago, we could have had nuclear power. You know, we, we could have done more. We haven't looked far enough ahead in the future and we are in grave danger of making the same mistake. I mean, the other side of this is what is the difference going to be? Blackouts are, you know, they're irritating and... Irritating? It'd be disastrous well, if it should destroy our now. economy. Well, they would be now, but, you know, um, some of us remember three-day weeks and things like that. And, in fact, you know, I grew up thinking that everybody had, you know, at least a couple of days a week when they had to eat off a of prime estate and things. This is, again, I don't want to harp on, but this is one of the problems in the politics in our country, isn't it? So many politicians, they just think in election cycles, Absolutely. they just think, what can I do and yeah. say to get my own backside re-elected uh, at the next general election? They're not always looking ahead. Uh, actually, politics aside, what is genuinely the best thing for this country? I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel.
Here's the thing. I like Andy Murray, but uh, Paul Coit, it appears he's on a sort of farewell tour leading up to, to Wimbledon yeah. or, or the Olympics, Olympics. Well, we haven't, we haven't worked out whether it's going to be Wimbledon or the Olympics. It looks like there's something. I mean, he hasn't even announced that he's going to retire. Give him clues. No. Well, he but, retired from the Miami Open um, this week. Well, he was retired out <laughs> of the Miami Open. Out it out wasn't of... him. Thomas Maschak. Um, so this is probably the last hard court tournament that he'll play. Uh, there's Andy there. And, you know, he played pretty well. I mean, which is what we seem to be saying all along, but not just the Andy Murray that we used to see. He's 36 now. Um, got a nasty ankle injury as well during the game. But the thing is, every time I see Andy Murray get an injury, you're thinking, Another oh, one. my goodness, mm. me, this is serious. Can we just it's talk about how short his shorts are? <laughs> Sorry, is that Mashuk there? Yes. But He's trying to copy me. That is not... I've never seen <laughs> that before. Mm, I mean, mm, call him mm. massive, massive thighs. Oh, I wonder what you were saying there, I mean, what you saw in the shorts. There's there's there he is, there's the injury. Yeah. Oh, look, that, he's... That looks if it hurt. That looks oh. nasty. And it's the ankle. Everybody said, oh, no, what has he done? He's maybe torn a muscle, but it's the ankle. He played on, but then he got angry as well. And then he was shouting into the crowd. It turned out there was a steward that was moving when he didn't want to. Oh, and then he was arguing he, with the umpire. Why would he even play on? You know you're not going to get anywhere with that. You just know it. But that... He's a fighter. He's right. That's what Andy Murray's about. I would stop. Yeah. You would stop. Would Andy Murray will play on until his leg was taken off and he'd probably say, I'll mm -hmm. carry on, because that's why he's still there. And that's what makes him the great champion. You summed it up. But um, anyway, so it's now off to clay court which is not his favourite surface, and that's where he's going to play Monte Carlo next. But okay. is can, can, we play, can we play birthday day? Thing? Oh, you want to play birthday? Can we play birthdays? Want to play birthdays? Whose birthday is it today? OK, well, you tell me. How... I don't know. Well, no, you look. And this then is you... a quiz. You this know how the quiz, quiz works. Is... <laughs> right, OK. Let's have a look, shall we? OK, right, Whose right, birthday right. Is... Whose birthday Who is? possibly sporting <laughs> birthday right. could we have first? Who could it be? Right, OK. Right, OK, we're ready for him. It's going to take a while. <laughs> gonna... Can you guess whose birthday it is? I won't tell you. There we are. Oh, look, there we are. Oh, that's, the, that's the mural that's easy on the side of Vicarage Road. Elton's birthday okay. today. How a life president? Isn't he the life president of Watford? I would say he is. I don't know the answer to that, but I do... I would say he's got to be in his 80s. I'd say he's what? 80s. Oh. Do you reckon? Oh, well, I think so. I think he's 82. Controversial. Oh, my. OK. Uh, so you're going with I 82 reckon, for Elton. I reckon he's still standing at... Oh, I see what you did there. Uh, I very you, much like thank it. Thank you. I'm going to go 70. Yeah. 70 and 82. Yeah, well, he's, he's older than... He'd be it's somewhere in between. Listen, you can both... You're too low, you're too oh, okay. high. Just have another go. 75. 75. What do you reckon? I'm is he... I'm going 78. 77. Oh. Ooh. 77 well for Elton. Do you want to go again or another one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's yeah, go with another yeah. one. Probably a little bit younger, this one. Um, someone who I don't know how you feel about him, eh, uh, Eamon, because Manchester United have then he's gone back on loan to uh, Borussia Dortmund, Jaden Sancho. Not in the England setup at the moment. Whether he'll be back for the Euros, we don't know. 21. 21 for Jaden. He was, he was the wunderkind. Of, uh, of Dortmund. Oh, so maybe that was a few younger. years ago. Oh, right, okay. So maybe a little older, but. Um, 23. 23. I'm going to let you go again. Oh, really? OK, 24. Is the correct answer. Ah! Oh, <laughs> but second time lucky. Is the Thanks, right Robin. answer. <laughs> Eamon is very unhappy that Isabel. No, no, back, no. Right? I, see I, looking I just. I'm, I'm very unhappy at him. He's a waste of time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's, over, he's, over in, he's over in Germany at the moment. There they are. Elton. And Jaden. I love Elton so much. Everybody good, game, him. good game, good game. <laughs> well done, well done. Well, let's thank have a look much, at what you could have won, shall we? <laughs> let's have That's a look for another day. Won. Paul Coit, thank you very thank much you. indeed, our have sports a maestro. OK, D uh, your pet, right? Your yeah, pet which one? Dudley or Nelly? Yeah, two right. dogs. You would do anything. If something's wrong with them, you bring them to the vet and basically, I suppose, you'd oh, pay anything. it's costing their fortune. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. See, even if there's, like, a grass seed in the paw, you go in there and then, oh, that's, like, another 1,000 quid. Nelly had three teeth out, or three or four oh. teeth out, because she's a rescue. It cost me over £1,000 oh, pulling teeth. Oh, gosh. Incredible. I would have done it myself. Such, such is the love. I know, but it is true. You'd do anything for your pets. My little Maggie's got uh, a bad knee, uh, which we have to X-ray and inject and things, and... Uh, I didn't just... know they had knees. Is well, it? Well, because it's sort of knee. like the front, outside. Front it's not paws. like a knee. Front front paws. Paws. Yeah, but no, is that, that the front paws? The front paws. But do they have a knee? Yes. <laughs> okay.
This is basic. It's not a leg, back it's legs. back to front. So I didn't know that's a knee on yeah, that bit. That's yeah, a yeah. Knee. You're, well, your elbow is, that's a knee. <laughs> okay. Right. okay. I can't believe I'm even demonstrating oh, anyway. the dog's knee. But anyway, sorry. sorry. Uh, we're talking about unprecedented vet costs, and this was made public by uh, an actor in Coronation Street, and uh, it's just making owning a pet maybe unaffordable. Is it unaffordable for you? What's your story? We're going to be talking about that next. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise and who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at seven o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panelists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from seven on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, eight till nine on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. In the papers uh, last week, we're browsing through as we do every day uh, here with the newspapers, and this one caught my eye. Uh, in Coronation Street, there's Daniel Brocklebank. Uh, you'll know Daniel. Uh, he's the vicar, isn't he? And uh, he, was, uh, he was hit with a vet bill of £2,100 for one of his dash hounds there. And it wasn't only the cost of the bills. He was shocked to pay £26.90 for paracetamol, which he then found out paracetamol is paracetamol. There's no such thing as pet paracetamol and then paracetamol for Eamon and Isabel. It's available in the chemist at 38p. So many stories people have been emailing in since you were talking about this a little bit earlier. Debbie says, my cat had an eye abscess. We went to a vet a few times. It wasn't healing. They prescribed an eye drop for £96. When I got home, I looked online. It was £6.99. <gasps> Talia, we paid 105.36 for our dog to be seen with his ear. It was a 10-minute appointment. I was given a 50 ml bottle of drops. Ear drops I then researched online cost £15. Disgusting. And what was he charged? 105. Oh. 
Good. The marker. It's, it's, it's a rip-off and it's a common story uh, for pet owners right around the whole country and it led the Competition and Markets Authority to say, why? Why has this happened? So they launched a formal market investigation, 56,000 responses they got from that, from pet owners and vets themselves and all of this. And uh, apparently a lot of this is due to uh, new owners of vets. So they're buying two, three, four, five, six veterinary practices and they're under the auspices of, uh, what would you call it, big like business? A super, a super vet or conglomerate. Super vet yeah. Or hedge fund people mm -hmm. or whatever. So they're getting a lot of money because they know you, me and Isabel will pay whatever it takes to put our pets mm. right. Right, let's see our lineup on this, who we've got. Uh, over the weekend, these people got in touch with us. Uh, there, first of all, we say hello, good morning to dog behaviourist Zoe Willingham, retired civil servant Emma Parsons, uh, Emma Parsons Reed, I think that is, and consumer blogger and puppy owner Jane Hawks. Now, I want to go through the three of you and find out how many pets or what sort of pets you have. Zoe, first of all, tell me about how many pets are you responsible for? Um, currently, I have over 100 animals in my care. Uh, I'm a rescuer and I take on and rehab animals, so um, ranging from dogs, cats, tortoises, um, birds, etc. So, yeah, I've got oh, lots under my care at the moment. I, don't, I, I dread to ask you about bills and things like that, but that, I, that's just cost. That is amazing. Uh, Emma, what about you? Um, well, I've currently just got two cats, so, um, yeah, I had obviously had a third one, which I'll tell you about um, in a bit. What do you mean? But just the two me, cats at the moment. moment. Tell me, what happened to the, the, the third one? Um, my, my cat Phoebe last year, um, her eyes started to be pushed out. Um, and uh -oh. oh, we'll try and sort out the connection to that. looks like a beautiful rag doll or some sort of I think, rag doll. I think, I think she's Little about to Phoebe. tell us that Phoebe's passed away. Yeah, Phoebe got oral cancer, I think. Um, right. Oh, And then, dear. Uh, Emma, let, okay. so who, does, who does that leave us with? I'm not sure We've got who, Jane in the middle Jane, there. Jane in the middle. Come on, Jane, tell us now how many pets you have. I've got two I dogs. I can see my cat uh, got... I've got Barney, who's a Labradoodle, and he is almost 10. And I've got Bertie, who is two and a half, and he is a Labrador. OK, what's your experience, Jane? We'll begin with you. What's your experience with vets and Bertie and Barney? Yeah, well, I've always been quite worried about, about vets' costs. They always kind of double check, think twice before I take them just so it's not a wasted visit because the consultation in itself is, is, is no considerable sum. And then as you've gone through some of the expenses that, that people are faced with once they do go, you know, some things which are really, really overpriced, then I just want to make sure that I always dot the I's across the T's. And I took out um, insurance because I thought that um, it would be a good cost effective way in the long term of making sure that they got the best of care. And it started off about £50 a month uh, for both of them. It went up because I claimed on Barney's insurance and almost doubled. So now I've managed to get it back to the £50. But when he had um, cancer, he had an MCT a couple of years ago now, then those costs I was facing were towards five grand. So really, it was a drop, it was a drop in the ocean and worth every penny. Gosh, yeah. Well, this is the thing. People are prepared to pay huge amounts. Because um, I think we, we don't know, because it's not... You can look at one of your children and you can talk through an experience that you had yourself and you can say, well, they've got a bit of a temperature, that'll take two days. Where does to... it hurt? And they can tell you. Yeah, they can tell you, whereas your pet mm. doesn't talk to you. Zoe, is that what you find? I mean, you've got so many to deal with. Yeah, I mean, the for me, I have to really think about when I do go to the vets, but I have to say I go to an independent vet and I am very, very lucky with my vet in the fact that I trust them. Um, yes, it does cost me a lot of money, but I would do whatever it took to actually make sure my pets were OK. Um, so, yes, yeah, so, you know, a vet bill can range anything from £100 to up to £8,000, you know, it depends on what's needed. And, and but you, I accept I have to pay that. You, you have quite a good knowledge of veterinary surgeries, don't you? Because you used to be a veterinary veterinary nurse and Eamon and I were just discussing earlier who's making money from all these big what were we calling them conglomerates that are, is this the vets making money here because my experience of vets is that they're very hard working not necessarily paid what they perhaps deserve when you think the level of training and skill involved in being able to operate on anything from a hamster to a cow um, you know is it the vets that are pocketing this huge increase that we're seeing 
No, I don't think it is. I mean, ultimately, what we need to have a look, think about is I actually think vets are actually massively undercharging, actually, for what they actually do. Um, having worked on this side and having worked from a consumer side, um, they are massively undercharging. The skill and expertise that those people have they don't just close a laptop and go home at the end of the day. They're still thinking about your pet. They're still thinking about the pet they've had to put to sleep. They're still had to help, you know, they're, they're not turning off. Um, the one thing about our, our vets is I think they're massively undervalued because we have an NHS and everything's free to us. We don't understand the true cost of healthcare for our animals. That doesn't mean yeah, it makes but, it but any paracetam easier. Paracetamol is not the true cost. That's the thing, you know, 38p paracetamol compared to £26. Um, I see that you're, you're nodding away there. Um, I'm sorry we lost you. We've got you back and you were about to tell us about Phoebe, um, your, your cat. Yes, uh, yeah, Phoebe, in a nutshell, it, it went on. I was back and forth to the vets. They wanted me to have expensive scans. And, you know, you know, like a gut instinct with your children, you know something's not right. So... Um, I was crying by the end. She was practically dying. And they said, oh, well, we can do an operation on her, but we'll have to do some liver tests first, then we'll have to do this. I took her to an independent vet. He took one look, showed me she was riddled with oral cancer, and it was pushing her eye out. Um, and he put, her down, he put her to sleep within 10 seconds. And my husband and I practically fell on him with gratitude because Aww. we'd been through so much with her. She didn't deserve the last nine days of the hell. She should have been put to sleep as soon as we took her, because our, the, the original vet would have seen that it was oral cancer, because now I could di diagnose oral cancer, because I know what it looks like. So, it, it was a travesty of so just Emma, trying to make money. It's profit before right. pets. So what you were saying is that this other vet was looking, probably knew what the outcome was going to be, but was trying to make money by persuading you to do procedures that were hugely expensive, because yes. you would have done anything to keep yeah. little Phoebe with you. And, Jean, I'm sure that's Deary, the same yeah. with course, you. And, Jane, I'm sure and, that's and they, the same they, with they, you, they, that you would do you would do anything and um, and they, they know it. I mean, and uh, Zoe was talking about, you know, how she doesn't believe vets overcharge, but somebody's overcharging, whether it's for the, the services um, required or the medication involved. Give us your, your views, Jane. Yeah, well, they have really got you over barrel because kind of the emotional blackmail because you are willing to pay. You, you, you're desperate to find really the money to be able to cover those costs. And, um, you know, I do agree um, with with, uh, with um, Zoe in respect to, you know, people, these are, you know, these are professionals. They've got a lot of expertise and, and what they, they're they going to take really good care of your pets. So I think we have to value people in their role, but we have to make this affordable to all. And it is becoming vet care elite. It's becoming, as you said earlier, some kind of luxury and it shouldn't be that way and that's what we need to work on. Guys, we've got to leave it there but uh, you know what the three of you have done is I think a lot of people can identify with what you're saying and uh, they, they take your various arguments and they will be getting in touch with us mm -hmm. and maybe we'll talk about this again next week I think because we've, we've started something here. Um, so um, thank you the three of you very much indeed Emma, Jane and Zoe thank yes. you very much and Appreciate out, it. if you are a vet uh, you. we want to hear from you if we, if we take this further let's hear what the vets have to say in all of this are they getting frustrated that they're being bought out by these conglomerates do they think that they're being unfairly sort of seen as these money making schemers mm. um, let us know your views you're I'm sure, welcome I'm sure they're frustrated as they're mm. lying on the beach with a million <laughs> quid I'm sure they're very frustrated uh, with that, uh, Mick took my dog to the vets with irritation in his rear end. Oh, hey man, it's not was, funny. Was with, was with this the is why vet. you couldn't be a vet. I was, See, this is hard work. Yes, I was with the vet for three minutes and given a tube of cream, 63 quid for that visit. So 63 quid for uh, an irritated rear end. Oh, okay. um, but I'm sure it was worth it to the, the dog. Imagine we put a tube of cream on an irritated rear <laughs> end. We'll talk to Biggins about that right after about. this. Biggins and Don need some after this. <laughs> big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's tonight, 9 till 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. 
GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Nana Queer, weekends from 3 p.m. OK, this is getting beyond ridiculous. Trans women, which, as we know, are biological males, are apparently now going to be included as women in a push to get more female chief executives into the FTSE 100 by it next year. Now, the campaign called 25 by 25 is an initiative headed by Chief Executive Tara Kemmerling jones whose mission is to get 25 female chief executives running blue-chip companies by 2025, and it's backed by major companies including Unilever, NatWest and BP. You couldn't make this up. Tara said anyone who identifies as a woman is a woman. What's the point? Seriously, if anyone can say that they're a woman, then why bother with this at all? It just makes a mockery of the whole thing. Will the trans woman have a salary of a man or a woman? As we know, there are still major gender pay gap inequalities, and it will be a complete misrepresentation of women or, and on boards of pay and average salaries. Only last month, Tory MPs accused the financial services watchdog, the FCA, of putting women's rights at risk by encouraging banks to collect staff data based on self-identified gender rather than biological sex. Of course, it was met with resistance from some 40 MPs and peers who wrote to the Chancellor to argue that the FCA was taking an activist approach to its diversity policies. This morning, I read about a school, a health nurse who claimed that not all people who have babies might call themselves a she or a woman or a mum. She said that walking through a school in a skirt and letting your hair grow when actually people previously knew you as a boy, well, that's incredibly brave. That's what she said. But I think there's an element of attention-seeking, if I'm totally honest. But the worry is it could lead to a path of medical transition when most people going through puberty are struggling with their gender identity in any case. Biology trumps ideology, and it's time to take a stand. Here's Dawn and Christopher, and the first thing I'm going to talk about <laughs> is William Shakespeare, right? Yeah. Uh, who I believe is... Um, <laughs> interesting. Interesting <laughs> and, and unnecessary, like Dawn. Like boring, because this is the Don, PG Don, version. I, I've studied Shakespeare. I've got numerous qualifications related to Shakespeare. <laughs> I do understand it if, um, you know, someone's doing it, if it's Serene McKellen or whatever, playing a part... Absolutely appreciate all of that. But uh, I don't see why every child at every school should have Shakespeare rammed down their throat. Well, no, quite. This story is actually it's an £800,000 project funded by the Arts and Humanities, Humanities Research Council at the University of Roehampton has found that basically Shakespeare was our... Um, Shakespeare has made theatre to pal, mal and style. Well, of course, it blooming well has, hasn't it? Because what else was around in Shakespeare's time? Actors were men. It was white, and they were probably older as well. I mean, it's just ridiculous, but it's taxpayers' money being funded on something that is just frankly ridiculous and that we don't need to be... It's, it's more wokeness. Do you know what I'd like? It's woke. Yeah, do you know, I would like to go and see a Shakespeare's Greatest Hits over two hours or so. It was seen from Macbeth, a scene from um, How You... As You Like It or whatever it happens yeah. to be. And But I'm not interested in the overall... Two and a half, three hours of... of yeah, I think it play. depends. I mean, I... What have you done? What have you... <laughs> well, I years ago, I played Puck in A Midsummer Night's Dream. In fact, I, it was Regent's Park Open Air Theatre. In fact, I was the best Puck of the Park that year. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, very uh, good. It was, it was... I really enjoyed it. But I, I, th you can go along and see Shakespeare and be thrilled, and you can go along and be bored. That is the fascinating did thing. Did you actually understand the lines that you were reciting? I did, because I made a point of understanding them, because I wanted the audience to understand. Them. But often, I don't think that's a very good point you've made because I don't think people do know what they're no. saying. I don't think you can go and watch a Shakespeare play unless you already know it. It's yes. almost like you have to understand the story, the story. and the characters yeah. and perhaps have even done a bit of reading into it. Because if you went 
completely blind, especially in today's world where we don't speak in that kind of way. Um, it is, I think, probably a bit alienating. But Dawn, Dawn is saying it is alienating at the moment because of the lack of uh, representation. I, you know what, the actual phrasing they use, right, OK. The disproportionate representation um, propagated white, able-bodied, heterosexual, cisgender male narratives. I'm sure there's people sitting in a room going, What's the most ridiculous thing we can come up with today? Yes. But I really just chuck all these words and it's cisgender and it's just insane. Mm. Of course, Shakespeare was what it was back in the day, and that's why it is it's mostly blokes and they're mostly white. And lots of speculation that he was actually gay, isn't there? Because he never really saw Anne Hathaway very often and stayed away a lot of the time. I don't know, he maybe he was a big He might have gay been transgender for all I know. I mean, I I don't I... <laughs> Begins, I'm looking at you. No, I think you're right. I mean, you know, I think uh, that goes for the profession too. Mm. Mm. Uh, I mean, it, it's a. Uh, I, I, I do think we. I mean, I remember seeing Macbeth in London with Judy Dench and Ian McKellen, and it was one of the most exciting wow. evenings ever. And it was a cold night in the Donmar Theatre, outside and inside, and it, that gave it atmosphere. There are certain things, and you go along and see something else, and you think, I'll walk out in the interval. Yeah. Macbeth is, is so a bad. sexy play, though. It like is a Macbeth. And it's yes. a short play, yes. too, mm -hmm. yeah. because mm -hmm. yeah. often... Um, yeah. Let's talk about... Um, oh, there's so many. Can I live to be 100? Oh, um, this is depressing. I think it is depressing. Oh. I like to stay here and now. I don't want to live to 100. Oh, don't and say I'm that. I'm right behind you. I don't you. even want to. My father died at 63 that'd be me gone this year um, <laughs> and I just don't I don't see the point there's no point living longer if you're not living no, better but you, no, I agree. You've got your grandchildren surely you want to see them married oh I couldn't care less <laughs> I don't like weddings anyway no I do, I'm not sitting to, no but listen listen as you get older you realize no one cares about you no, right it's not true. no but it is true Amy, we care that, we what? do care about no you. people yeah. say oh, oh it's awful even in that chair it's awful my mum's anyway. 74 today and I I dread Happy birthday. Mom. Yeah, happy birthday, mum. Well. I, happy I birthday. adore my mum and I want her to live to see my children married and well, what if we her all knees do? are hurting and her back's hurting and her ears oh, are hurting and whatever? Fine. Well Keep I going. Can, I tell you, I don't want to be. Figgins, what's your point? No, about? I would absolutely hate it. I, I, another twenty-five years of this life. Yes. No, thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> now I've had it. And you know the serious point is that they think that we're being curmudgeonly or whatever about this. When you suffer pain and anxiety God, absolutely. and you can't hear and you can't see and you can't do yeah. whatever whatever it is. Um, what is the point? No, the and point? I, I don't want to be pooing my pants oh, and, yeah. you know, throwing up and all that business. Well, no, wait till but... you do poo your pants and then you will, you will, think, you will think about it because that's yeah. what you have nursing care for and that's why nurses should be paid more than anybody else in the country. Absolutely. What they have to go through looking after us uh, oldies. Mm -hmm. Welcome to Breakfast TV. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you're um, having a lovely meal. I don't know. <laughs> We've got one minute 20, Dawn, but I really want to squeeze this story in. Adultery may still be a sin, but will soon be legal in New York. Did you know Tell it was illegal? More. Did you know it was illegal? I actually didn't know it was illegal. No, no, no. It's a... Yeah, it, uh, adultery um, has been illegal in New York, uh, um, Oklahoma, what, you Wisconsin, can go to jail Michigan. If you cheat on your husband. You can absolutely, yeah, a, a five hundred dollar fine or ninety days, ninety days in jail if you tr cheat on your spouse. Can't talk straight, wasn't it? Sorry, um, <laughs> but it's one of sixteen states where cheating is still a criminal offence. But that is being repealed now, so you can go and be unfaithful in New York, and you won't get banged up for it. I must just quickly continue that theme. There's a park bench in Bristol, and this is hysterical. She's the wife, the husband died, the wife did this park bench. There's a plaque for my love, the year he was born, the year he died, husband, father, adulterer. <gasps> yes, Roger. I knew. Ah, <laughs> I love that. And I saw everyone else. Yes, exactly. Yes, I love it. Wow. I love it. Revenge is best so Exactly. Cold. I take my hat off to that woman. <laughs> Did it make him a bad person? Uh, That's the question. Was she behind his death? <laughs> Who knows? Biggins um, and Dawn, thank you both very much indeed. Very informative, very entertaining, as yeah. per usual. Thank, thank you very you much both. indeed. Thank you. Uh, the weather picture. Um. Good morning, Marco. <laughs> Looks like things are heating up. Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. 
Hello, here's your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. After a quieter end to the weekend, things are turning more unsettled, I'm afraid, once we head through the new working week. Further spells of wind and rain to come across all areas, and that wet and windy weather is already pushing across western and southwestern parts of the UK. I think as we go through the day today, we could see some particularly heavy rain across the southwest of England, and that will start to turn to snow as it reaches colder air north of the central belt across parts of Scotland, especially later on this afternoon. Towards the southeast, we'll see the best of the brightness, although there will be some brighter skies towards the far north northeast of Scotland, coupled with some wintry showers too. In that sunshine in the southeast, we'll peak at 12 Celsius, 54 in Fahrenheit, but it will be a colder afternoon towards the north. Turning very uh, unsettled across Scotland then as we go through the overnight period tomorrow night into Tuesday. A warning comes into a force at midnight because see some heavy rain at low levels, snow across the hills, up to 20 centimetres or so of snow as by the time we get into Tuesday morning. And elsewhere it's a fairly mixed picture, some clear spells but also showers or longer spells of rain never too far away. But those temperatures generally hold up, at least away from the north where we will see a bit of a frost. Into Tuesday then, certainly through the morning, a very unsettled picture once again across Scotland. Further rain and snow to come, snow again mainly on the hills. And elsewhere it's a case of sunshine, but with showers or longer spells of rain once again never too far away. And the temperatures will be struggling on Tuesday, no better at, uh, than uh, 10 or 11 Celsius towards the south. 11 is 52 in Fahrenheit, nearer 4 or 5 degrees in the north. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. It's the final week to see how you could win big. You could win an amazing £12,345 in tax-free cash that you could spend however you like. Plus, there's a further £500 of shopping vouchers to spend at your favourite store. We'll also give you a gadget package to use in your garden this spring. That includes a games console, a pizza oven and a portable smart speaker so you can listen to GB News on the go. You have to hurry as lines close at 5pm on Friday. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Yeah, well, when it comes to fish and chips, we all know they're a part of a British tradition and the Golden Chippy is, is an award-winning uh, restaurant and for years they've been serving the community here in Greenwich and even today on a Sunday, they are fully packed today. But this is the issue. Here we've got a mural and which says a great British meal. Residents who live in this area who've complained uh, to Greenwich Council who say it's inappropriate uh, considering it's in a conservation area. Here's what some of the local people we've been speaking to had to say. What's wrong with it? It looks all right, doesn't it? Do you know what I mean? Look at some of the other you have got around in Greenwich. They don't want to take that down, do they? But when you've got something like this, it's half day, so I don't want to remove it. Fantastic artwork. I really like it. Reminds me of Banksy. Well, those are the views here from people who live in this local area. But I'm kindly joined by Chris, the owner. Thank you so much for your time this afternoon. You've been here for 20 years now. Um, tell, tell me how this issue has come up. They take pictures. It's only been up for about a month. And uh, it's been very, very popular. I don't want to believe that any of the locals are uh, complaining that this is uh, too loud or anything like that. They say... It's, it needs planning permission. How a little thing like this needs planning permission, I don't know. Are you working with an artist in this local area? I've got a local uh, guy that uh, does uh, murals, so he said, uh, would you like me to do something for you? I said, yes, why not? I said, make sure you leave a bit of space for people to stand there so they can uh, take some selfies or pictures or whatever they want to do from Golden Chippy. And it's been extremely popular, and not one person has come to me and said, that looks terrible. So I cannot imagine the person that complained about this. I think it's just cancelled. Good morning. It is fast approaching 9 o'clock. It's Monday the 25th of March. You are very welcome to breakfast with Amy and Isabel. Very welcome from both of us. Uh, headlines on this Monday morning are a boost to 
Nuclear defense is set to be announced as the threat of Putin looms large. And it's not just Putin. Deputy Prime Minister Oliver Dowden's raising the alarm over more Chinese cyber attacks as senior MPs and peers are also being targeted. Yes, the government wants to talk about boosting our nuclear defences, but that's been largely overshadowed by uh, China. The threat from China, uh, hacking, etc. The government announcing consequences later. I'll bring you more shortly. Thank you, Catherine. Whitehall sources also fear the two nations could be behind the wave of slurs and conspiracies against the Princess of Wales online. What's that about? It's a bid to destabilise the UK, apparently. Hello, good morning. After a fairly quiet end to the weekend weather-wise, I'm afraid the week ahead does look unsettled once again. There'll be further spells of wind and rain at times, and I'll have all the details later. So here is our top story on this Monday morning. We're with you right through until 9.30. The Prime Minister will declare new funding to secure the future of the UK's nuclear industry. The Prime Minister hopes the announcement will create 40,000 new jobs by the end of the decade. Earlier, we spoke to the Minister for Energy Security and Net Zero, Andrew Bowie. We're going to be creating uh, hundreds of thousands of new high-wage high school jobs, the length and breadth of the country, many in places where high-wage jobs uh, are actually at a premium. And that's why I'm so excited about the investment that we are making today uh, in Sizewell C and Hinkley Point C and a third gigawatt scale project coming down the line after that and our small modular reactor program. This is going to create a whole new uh, range of energy technologies to support our transition to uh, become more energy secure and independent. But yes, it is about creating uh, new new jobs in parts of the country where, where they are desperately needed. Well, this news comes today as the Deputy Prime Minister Oliver Dowden is expected to tell Parliament that Beijing is behind a wave of cyber attacks on senior MPs and peers. OK, let's go back to our political correspondent, Catherine Foster. She's got all there is to know on this. Catherine, tell us. Yes, good morning, Eamon and Isabel. Well, the government is very keen to talk nuclear today, nuclear defence and nuclear power. We know, of course, that uh, uh, we need increased energy security after Russia invaded Ukraine, so a move for more nuclear reactors. Also, the next generation of nuclear submarines being built at Barrow in Furness. The hope altogether is for 40,000 new jobs, as Andrew Bowie just said. Now, some will say this is all a bit late. The Conservative government have been in power for 14 years. Nuclear reactors take a long time to build, to develop. Um, but the government would say, well, the world has changed. The threat has become greater. But today, too, a huge amount of focus on the threat from China. Now, back in the early coalition years, uh, David Cameron, now Foreign Secretary, of course, and George Osborne, the then Chancellor, used to talk about a golden age of relations with China. The red carpet uh, was rolled out. But how times have changed, because today um, evidence has emerged that uh, Chinese have tried to hack into uh, dozens of MPs and peers' uh, uh, accounts. Also, that 40 million people's details uh, registered with the Electoral Commission uh, have been hacked by China too. So a real threat from China to our national security. Now, um, some of the, the MPs concerned, including Sir Ian Duncan-Smith, uh, the former um, leader of the Conservative Party and are really critical on China, are having a meeting this lunchtime. They're going to be holding a press conference later. And then Deputy Prime Minister Oliver Dowden is going to make a statement talking about what sanctions they are going to bring in onto Chinese officials. So a tougher line on China, but the Conservative Party has been quite conflicted in their approach to China over the last few days, uh, years, apologies. So it'll be interesting to see what happens today. Okay. Catherine, thanks very much indeed.
Uh, now, we're going to be talking to the winner of The Apprentice 2022 next. Her name is Harpreet Kaur, and she's going to be giving us advice on how best to save our money. Lots of concerns out there. High uh, housing costs and, and prices going through the roof. Inflation is coming down. Uh, but, well, it's a hard time for anybody who's trying to save cash. So what are your top tips? Good morning. Good morning. Hi. Um, yeah, I mean, I think first just to acknowledge that it's a difficult time for everybody. Um, you know, we've had a cost of living crisis. Inflation keeps rising. And I think there's a lot of people in the UK that are feeling exactly the same, where they are struggling to save. Um, and that really affects their ability to deal with anything that crops up. And people don't have a retirement fund either. So from my perspective, there are the things thing that is, Harpreet, the thing is, Harpreet, the, the main thing is, is that we're looking at there are 11 million people in the country who, when it comes to saving, they are saving, but they have less than a thousand pounds in savings, which basically ain't going to be very good if you hit the rocks. Absolutely not. I mean, a thousand pound nowadays, it's not really going to get you very far. From my perspective, um, you know, I'm a business owner and there are quite a few principles that we like little tips and tricks that we do as business owners that I think could help people, you know, in their kind of daily lives, maybe just put some pennies to the side. Um, I think my, my top one is reviewing your daily expenses. Um, this probably seems like an absolute no brainer, but when you really look at the figures, if you save just 10 pounds a day and cut something out that you pro probably isn't a necessity. So for example, we all nip to a coffee shop, you grab your coffee, but then you probably grab a little snack as well. Saving £10 a day will save you over £3,500 over the year by that one little sacrifice. And that will probably cover the cost of your rise in your mortgage, your rise in your electricity bills. Um, but you've got to extend it further. So, for example, another quick one is if you go on your phone and you look at your app subscriptions, there's a lot of sneaky apps these days which you sign up for a free trial and then you get roped in. So you've got to take the time to sit, review what you've got, and I, I can promise you there'll be lots of things that you can cancel. I've Harpreet, done it myself. Uh, Harpreet, I do, I do have to say, I think your coffee idea is genius because I'm lucky I don't drink coffee. But, Isabel, <laughs> how often do you go down the high street and you see people spending that six and seven and eight pounds uh, on a coffee, guilty. maybe twice a day? Yeah, you do, definitely. You, you... Well, I look, not every day, because I'm lucky enough to get free coffee here at work, but if I'm not at work, I'll often treat myself to a coffee, and it is, it feels like a treat, but it adds up, and I do sort of feel guilty about it. Yeah. Um, but I noticed one of your other tips is to negotiate, and I think this is something, as Brits, we are terrible at. Mm. But I, I'll just give my own example. I'm getting new carpets on my stairs and my living room. We had a, two carpet fitters out, and one carpet fitter came to us, and I said to him, look, I've been told by my friend I can get a trade discount through her. Can I use the trade discount through you? Absolutely no negotiation at all to be had. And I felt so cheeky for even trying to save a little bit of money here, there, and everywhere. I, and that's put me off ever trying to negotiate again. So, so, that... so what do you say? They, they said no to Yeah, they to... said no. They said, yeah, look, yeah, our yeah, price yeah. is already competitive. Well, that's I'll tell you, I'll tell you this about profit. carpets, right? My family business yeah, yeah. is carpets, tell me, tell carpets. Me. And I'll tell you this, the prices they charge in Northern Ireland compared to London, it's like two different planets. Should we get someone in from Northern Ireland? Well, I th I, honestly, <laughs> you'd be better getting a team of carpet fitters from Northern Ireland or Wolverhampton or wherever and putting them up in a hotel for a week and getting them to do your house. You'd still be quids, quids yeah. better off with it. Harpy, uh, look, look yeah. sorry, quick one from you, Harpy, just to say goodbye. Um, I'm going to have to agree with you, Eamon. Always shop around, even if it is looking, you know, afar to get the best deal. And you've got to be cheeky because what's the worst that's going to happen? The person says no. Yeah, and it's so you can embarrassing just when they do. Oh. Yeah, yeah, well, okay. Would you rather be embarrassed? Would you yeah, rather be embarrassed or have yeah. that money in your bank? That's, that's why Top she tip. won The Apprentice. That's, exactly. why she, that's why she does what she does uh. and gets the big bucks. Appreciate it, Harpreet. Thank you very much. Come in and see us sometime. Thank you so much. Definitely. See you. Thank See you. Bye-bye. 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 Right, coming up, half past nine, Britain's newsroom. We've got Andrew and Bev get a bargain in the studio there. with How us. How they squeeze in so much <laughs> opinion and news for the price they charge. I just don't, I just don't know. Don't know. <laughs> we work very hard. Morning. How are you? Morning. Very good. How morning. are you two? Very yeah, well, Yeah, great. You. Yeah, what's in store? Well, Monday morning. Well, we're looking at Oliver Dowd, who's going to talk to the Commons today about um, how China has interfered with the Electoral Commission. But on the back of that, of course, Telegraph front page today is saying...
China, Russia, Iran, are they part of the deliberate subverting of opinion about the Princess of Wales? Mm -hmm. Of course they are. Yeah, they makes want sense, to, doesn't it? Yeah, and they want to whip up the controversy so yeah. that our government clamp down on us with further restrictions on the kind of things we can and can't say online. So I do think we have to react with a little caution to how we respond mm. to these threats. Don't let them win. Let's yeah. not let them win. Mm. Don't Let's mess keep with our the royal freedom. Family how, how, yeah. how do you let them get any sort of foot to toe nail in the door without them winning? What do you mean? I mean, as soon as you give business to China or Russia, surely then it's, it's open to hacking and well, manipulation. And there's a, there's a story in the papers today about the Chinese going to open a big electric vehicle battery fa factory yeah. near Coventry. 6,000 jobs. We want the money, don't we? we want yeah, the best we do. Oh, we're not so sure about them. Cyber, mm. the cyber yeah. piracy. I have a it's, real... It's a, it's, a, it's a conflict. And I have a real problem with international companies owning particularly our utilities. Mm. Our water, yeah. our electricity. Oh, scandal. mm. It is scandalous, and we've let that happen, I think, whilst nobody was really watching yeah. and there was mm. profit yeah. to be made. And there's a difference, isn't there, between EDF and France and, say, Chinese investment yeah. in a nuclear power plant? I mean, surely, as I don't to quote Eamon, like a blind man and a galloping horse could but see. Also, I mean, yeah, the, but the potential risk. The Spanish company that owns Heathrow Airport doesn't invest much money in Heathrow Airport, does it? Yeah. They no. are a disgrace. Yeah. They don't really own Heathrow, they own. Uh, uh, at least one airport in Northern Ireland. They may own both of them, I'm not yeah. sure. They own Glasgow. Yeah. And you look at mm. all of them mm. and they are an absolute disgrace what yeah. they've done, how they've run them down. They have, they have. Yeah. And they're just making money, they couldn't care less yeah. because there's no public opinion backlash in Spain. And from the sublime to the ridiculous, lollipop ladies. Yes! Lollipop ladies. Bring back lollipop ladies, in my opinion. I see a whole Volunteers generation. Volunteers or paid? I think they should be paid. I don't see why the council can't yeah, provide. Yeah, but I don't safe see a, a green just to broaden out your discussion. You see, I don't see why they shouldn't be put up as a voluntary job because I think a lot of people would do it. Yeah, mm. and we need them. We yeah. do. And to save a million pound for Hampshire Council is nothing. Absolutely, Penis, isn't it? they could yeah. find that somewhere else. But we've yeah. got a whole generation of children that can't cross the road. I see, you see it. We, you know, our viewers will see these kids. They're all looking at their phone. They're yeah. crossing the road, and you know, yeah. fatalities on the road for the children is going to go up. Green cross code. Remember that? Yeah, very yeah. well. Stop, look, and listen. But they don't okay. get taught that anymore. Well, you two, mm. stop, look, and listen. Start again <laughs> at half past nine. Uh, Hampshire Council, we've got a competition for you. Have a go. You could win yourself. How much is it? Twelve thousand three hundred and forty-five pounds of tax-free cash. Go. It's the final week to see how you could win big. You could win an amazing £12,345 in tax-free cash that you could spend however you like. Plus, there's a further £500 of shopping vouchers to spend at your favourite store. We'll also give you a gadget package to use in your garden this spring. That includes a games console, a pizza oven and a portable smart speaker so you can listen to GB News on the go. You have to hurry as lines close at 5pm on Friday. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. I think there's a limit on how many times you can enter either. So if you have already entered, you could have another go as well. You've got until Friday to get your entries in. Still to come, there are fears that Russia, China and Iran are fueling online conspiracies about the Princess of Wales. If they're not doing it, who is? We're talking about that next on Breakfast here at GB News with Damon and Isabel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister. And we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel.
This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Now, what's going on in Scotland? So they're implementing these draconian hate speech laws, which are going to come in into force on April the 1st, I kid oh, you ironically, not. Ironically, yeah. And then, um, basically, you can go to your local mushroom shop or whatever. Which I didn't know we had mushrooms farms in Scotland, no. because people aren't that keen on vegetables up the road. They're, they're... Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> not even a shiitake. But, um, but you can report a hate crime at these private... But you can do it anonymously, and then the police will, uh, I don't know, unleash the hate monster. I, I don't know what, how this works. What's going on? I think the hate monster... <laughs> <laughs> is mythical, yes. and um, I don't think the hate monster actually exists. What I do think is existing, I'm genuinely really worried about comedy, right? Yeah. Now, believe it or not, some people in Scotland, they're wrong, but they don't like me. Yeah. And I genuinely feel that a lot of time is going to be wasted. You know, if someone yeah. calls you a name in a shop, you probably deserved it, believe me. Um, also, called... comedy can be quite offensive, particularly yours. And I'm not necessarily sure. As I've said on the show before, I remember my mum was worried when we, we, Scotland had decided that all... Um, residential properties needed special smoke alarms and my mum was convinced this was to do with the hate crime and that there was a camera in them. I, 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 I don't think she's being that paranoid. I mean, it, Scotland is a kind of nanny state. You know, actually, Hamza Youssef, when he implemented the hate crime bill, put a, a subsection in that which said that they can criminalise you for things you've said in the privacy of your own home. Thankfully, Scotland doesn't have the largest arts festival in the world. Oh, wait. Oh, no, it does. No. It does. It actually does have that. And lots of comedians are up there. Now, we had this before because if you go back about to, uh, to 2000 and what was it, 2003, when New Labour were trying to push through their racial and religious hate crime bill. The comedians are silent now. Something has completely changed. There's been a gear shift. Oh, I mean, in the Irish hate crime bill, which is, which is going through at the moment, they actually define hatred as hatred. Brilliant. It's a complete circular definition. Well, yeah, absolutely. And that tells me, when something's woolly, that tells me that it's not going to be applied fairly. It's going to be applied according to the person applying it. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Goodness me, so much royal news, uh, a lot of it always uh, in relation to the Princess of Wales. Uh, now there are allegations on the front of The Telegraph today from Whitehall sources that they're quoting that China, Russia and Iran are behind these conspiracy theories and, frankly, slurs on the Princess of Wales. Uh, well, let's talk in more detail about all of this with Cameron Walker, our royal correspondent, as well as Katie Nicholl, the royal editor for Vanity Fair. And we should say that both of them are going to be hot-footing it to the palace probably a little bit later on today. So we're lucky to have mm. you with us um, this what's morning. It, what's in it for China and Russia and how credible would that accusation be? Well, I think the fact that, as we've seen from those weeks of wild conspiracy theories, that it really is very unsettling. It seems like such a small thing, doesn't it, that, you, you know, a, a, a hostile country might see this as an opportunity to destabilise Britain. But when you see, frankly, the crazy way that people were responding to the princess and all of the rumours about her health, it did destabilise the nation at a time when we can't really afford to be destabilised. Mm -hmm. Well, also, I suppose, Katie, the truth is that even the truth about the Princess of Wales, when she revealed on Friday night about her own health, that was destabilised. I mean, I was upset, had a lump in my throat. I know that you were emotional as well. A lot of people have been talking about how emotional that has made them. I suppose they're just tapping into that, aren't they? Yes, and, and even after that, that sort of re-victimisation of, of, of the princess, certain bots or, or accounts out there speculating that it was AI. I mean, they deliberately had it filmed by BBC Studios to avoid any of that sort of crazy conspiracy theory, and yet it continued. Mm. And actually, another narrative against the Prince of Wales, which I thought was terribly unfair because he wasn't sitting by her in that video message, which she'd intentionally wanted to do by herself. You have to hope that the common sense of the British public will prevail in all of this. She's very articulate. She's very camera-friendly, I would have thought, Cameron, just seeing what she did there. Yeah, she certainly is. And I think there's a danger that we give oxygen to all these bots accounts spreading this misinformation online. And the monarchy is the symbol of our nation, isn't it? And if the monarchy is destabilised, then so is the nation. That's kind of what the inference was from these Whitehall sources speaking to The Telegraph. But there is kind of form for this. Um, a... a a, 
a company that analyzes social media data looked at Meghan Markle actually between 2018 and 2019 and they found a thousand Russian bots accounts which were all heavily linked tweeted 2.5 million times about Meghan Markle within a six month period. So th there is form for this and in the past both Prince William and Prince Harry have publicly said that social media companies need to do more to tackle this kind of disinformation because it is very dangerous. And just how destabilising do you think this crisis is that the royals are facing at the moment? A lot of people have been saying over the weekend that actually the challenge they're facing is almost greater than the passing of the crown from, from the Queen to the late Queen to, to now our current mm. King. Do you think there's some truth in that? Well, I think royal sources uh, are saying this is a bit of a blip rather than an actual crisis. Um, uh, Ailsa Anderson, the former um, Qu Queen Elizabeth II's former prime um, press secretary was saying on Camilla Tomney's show yesterday uh, that it's very much just a blip because it's not an abdication or something like that. It's just a little bit of a health scare. They're getting treated and they'll be back on their feet um, soon. Um, Cameron saying a little bit of a health scare there. You see, I, I know I'm at the stage, I don't know what you're like, Isabel, you think, well, what can you mention? What can you not? Can you even mention if it's positive? But I'd just like to say that all medical people that I've spoke to privately um, are saying that she's in a very good place. Well, certainly she's going to be getting the best possible medical attention. That goes without mm. saying. Um, I think her message, which moved so many of us, was one that was filled with hope and optimism. And that really came across. She is a very positive person. She's incredibly strong. She will be really drawing on all of that strength. She's got three little children to look after um, and a big job to do one day. But I think when you look at... Um, this was an incidental finding, what they call it. They weren't looking for yeah. this. And therefore, that suggests that whatever they found was in an early stage. And that word preventative treatment, I think, is really important. Another word is adjuvant chemotherapy, where it's used to basically whip around the body and blitz any little cells that may be there that aren't necessarily... They got what they needed to get. Okay. She's, she's saying, I'm well. She probably feels great at the moment. Don't know how she's going to respond to this treatment, but I think we can feel she very looks positive. Great, she looks fine. She looks, she yeah. looks great. She looks tired. She looks, she looks like she has been through the mill because she has. Mm. She had clearly very serious mm. major surgery. That's going to knock it out of the fittest 40 something. And uh, she was incredibly fit and healthy to begin yeah. with. Um, I feel like, Katie, we have to mention Prince William in all of this because, goodness me, he's going through an awful lot. He's got he the weight of the world on his shoulders. He's not in touch with his brother anymore, who, of course, he went through a lot of his traumas with. And now he's worried about his dad and his wife. And he's yeah. trying to look after the kids as well. It, and with that sort of weight of monarchy resting heavily on him, I mean, between the Queen and the Prince of Wales, they are carrying out the lion's shares of duties. I mean, they're the sort of two principles that the public gaze will go to in the absence of the King and the Princess of Wales. But um, he's got... You're, you're right as well. He has lost his relationship with his brother, but he's actually got a much stronger relationship with his father and a great relationship with his wife. And he, he will be OK. He's very resilient, but I'm it's right. not... Easy. Let's talk about the relationship between uh, the Princess of Wales and the King. Um, they had a, a meal together after she recorded uh, this message last week. Yeah, there's some reporting that they had a private lunch at Windsor Castle. Very rare for just the two of them to sit down in a room together. And the Sun was reporting that the King was actually very emotional following this lunch. And I think that just does show you the strength uh, of their relationship. And also, the Sun was, seems to be suggesting that the King sees the Princess as basically another, a daughter of his, a daughter-in-law, daughter uh, yeah, and it's just really sad. Yeah, really, yeah. really sad. Um, well, thank you both very much, Katie and Cameron, uh, for this morning bringing us up to date on all these things. Well, so many royal matters. I've been told we've got a bit longer, actually, so there's plenty more we can talk about in all of this. And, Katie, we were talking um, just a little bit earlier about the Middletons in mm. all of this and where Prince William has lost his relationship with his brother. You can be certain that James and Pippa and the Middleton parents will be supporting him, as well as, of course, the King and Queen. So Supporting him, supporting Catherine, supporting the children. I think most people don't realise how pivotal the Middletons are and how crucial they are behind the scenes. Um, they're an amazing family. So would she be spending time with her parents or would her parents come to her? What way do you see that working in terms of privacy? Well, um, we don't want to go into too much detail as to where they are at the moment, but I know that where they are, there is plenty of space for mm. the Middletons to say, I can't imagine that at the moment 
her mother is too far away. Yeah, mm -hmm. quite okay. right. Very good. Good to hear. Well, we hope it all turns out well. Uh, thank you both very much indeed. Very much uh, appreciated your take on things. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you. And uh, stay warm at the palace, both of you. <laughs> yes. uh, we'll be back bright and early, 6 o'clock tomorrow morning, uh, and we'll have lots more for you, of course, all the latest on everything that's well, happening as you wake up uh, to it. Thank you today for talking about uh, the lollipop men and women, and a lot of you think that we've got to value them more. Mm. And uh, the, the situation with vets, where a lot of you think we don't have to value them more, and they're all being bought over by conglomerates and big companies and things. So I think that's something we'll talk about again. Andrew and Bev next with Britain's Newsroom. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello, here's your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. After a quieter end to the weekend, things are turning more unsettled, I'm afraid, once we head through the new working week. Further spells of wind and rain to come across all areas, and that wet and windy weather is already pushing across western and southwestern parts of the UK. I think as we go through the day today, we could see some particularly heavy rain across the southwest of England, and that will start to turn to snow as it reaches colder air north of the central belt across parts of Scotland, especially later on this afternoon. Towards the southeast, we'll see the best of the brightness, although there will be some brighter skies towards the far north northeast of Scotland, coupled with some wintry showers too. In that sunshine in the southeast, we'll peak at 12 Celsius, 54 in Fahrenheit, but it will be a colder afternoon towards the north. Turning very uh, unsettled across Scotland then as we go through the overnight period tomorrow night into Tuesday. A warning comes into a force at midnight. We could see some heavy rain at low levels, snow across the hills, up to 20 centimetres or so of snow as by the time we get into Tuesday morning. And elsewhere, it's a fairly mixed picture. Some clear spells, but also showers or longer spells of rain never too far away. But those temperatures generally hold up, at least away from the north, where we will see a bit of a frost. Into Tuesday then, certainly through the morning, a very unsettled picture once again across Scotland. Further rain and snow to come. Snow again mainly on the hills. And elsewhere, it's a case of sunshine, but with showers or longer spells of rain once again, never too far away. And the temperatures will be struggling on Tuesday. No better at, uh, than uh, 10 or 11 Celsius towards the south. 11 is 52 in Fahrenheit, nearer 4 or 5 degrees in the north. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Morning. Good morning. First time we've been on air since the announcement on Friday that Catherine, uh, Princess of Wales, has cancer. Dramatic. And are we being manipulated by the Russians, Iran and China? That's a suggestion. Uh, Oliver Dowd and the Deputy Prime Minister will be talking about that in the House of Commons Yeah. Today. Also, there's, there's a Traxa protest in Westminster today. We're going to be talking to one of the protesters and bring back the lollipop lady. Do you agree? Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7pm. Our first question comes from Elliot. Elliot, hello. Is, is Canada now an authoritarian state? Elliot, I think it's been an authoritarian state for a while. I mean, uh, under Trudeau, this is a new thing now. And this is coming from the Justice Minister, uh, who has Arif Virani. And he has defended this new power for their online harms bill. That sounds familiar. We've got something quite similar. And they're saying they can now impose house arrest on someone who they think might commit a hate crime in the future, right? That's scary stuff, isn't it? 
there's obviously a very dark side to this because you can't, or you sh in my opinion, you shouldn't be able to imprison somebody before they've done anything. Right. Well, it is Canada, <laughs> and, and uh, I know you, you in this country, you kind of kind of respect Canada as a country. America didn't even know it was a country until recently, <laughs> and I think that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to, to show themselves to be different than America. I think America has a responsibility to, to invade. Uh, you know what? <laughs> I do. You know, you're, you're kidding, but it may come down to this. It's, or this may just be a, a pre... Yeah, maybe. Well, I just think it's ridiculous that the idea yeah. of arresting someone... I mean, our government's yeah. bad enough, and the Scottish government's out of control, the Irish government's right. out of control. They're all talking about... I mean, the Irish government's got a new hate crimes bill where they're talking about they can seize your phone if they suspect you might have some material that could potentially yeah. stir up hatred. I mean, for God's sake, what does that mean? Your phone's full of that kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, well, <laughs> the government knows that. Yeah. But, um, but the, you're, you're right. But it has to do with the bigger picture, which is Canada has sucked itself in on the big team world. So, sorry, I'm going to say it. It's big team world. And what they're, what they're doing, this is not even a free speech issue. This is just about silencing uh, dissent well, against the Canadian government. It has nothing to do with openness and talk, whatever. It's like saying, we don't want these people to spread their you opinions. Know, opinions. Dangerous opinions. That's what speech codes and hate speech laws always do. Good morning, 9.30 on Monday, the 25th of March. This is Britain's News and GB News with Andrew Pearce and Bev Turner. Thanks for joining us this Monday morning. So a royal apology after it's emerged that rogue states contributed to the destabilising theories around the Princess of Wales' health before her announcement of cancer. Do we now owe the royals an apology? And Chinese cyber attack. The Deputy Prime Minister Oliver Dowden will inform the Commons today that the Chinese government is behind a massive cyber attack on 40 million of us. They've got all our voting details. Is our democracy under assault? And a nuclear national plan. Rishi Sunak is to set out a national endeavour to secure a nuclear future for the UK in both defence and civil energy. But will he be able to deliver it? And will it solve the country's energy problems? Tractor farmers result. Westminster's braced for an invasion of tractors today as farmers voice their opposition to cheap food imports. This is the first sign that big continental rural revolt is about to hit Britain with full force. Nuclear plan. I mean, it, it sounds great. It's a bit late in the 